Oh, yeah, yeah, this is much better. OK, 这样可以，谢谢。OK。So, OK. In the previous chapter, OK, chapter 10, OK, uh, by the way, I mean, we, we, we just finished chapter 10, OK. And uh, now we are on chapter 11, in chapter 11, OK. So chapter 11 talked about like uh, uh, how to train the techniques on how to train the neural networks, OK? So, um, um, so we, 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 although we, 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 we try to train our neural network in the previous chapter, OK? But it, it's a very slow, shallow uh, DNN uh, with only two hidden layers. So when you have a complex problem and uh, if you want to create like a, you know um, a more complex uh, model, and it, you know you may have like a ten layers, each containing hundreds of neurons, and the, you will find that okay, simply using <coughs> I'm sorry, simply using the feet to train the model a lot of time doesn't work. Okay, it doesn't. It doesn't converge, okay? It's, it would not be a walk in the park. It's not that easy, okay? So what are the problems? What caused the, the training to be difficult, okay? The first one, okay, you would face the tricky vanishing gradient problem or on the opposite, exploding gradient problem, okay, which will affect the deep neural network and make the uh, uh, low layers very hard to train, okay? So this is like, um, you know, the first issue. The second issue is uh, you may not have enough training data, okay? Uh, you, you may only have like a, a limited amount of training data, but you, for a very complicated task, so what do you do? Okay, keep in mind, Collecting training data, as I mentioned earlier, that it is not necessarily a difficult job nowadays, but it take, still takes a lot of time to label your data. Okay, uh, um, uh, collecting data may not take uh, a, a lot of effort. You can just write a uh, crawler, web crawler to collect the data, but to label data a lot of time require like a special uh, expertise. Okay, for example, okay, let, let me, okay, sometimes if, if you want to train a model that determine a cat, uh, a picture, oh, not necessarily cat, okay, a picture is cute or not, okay, object, Okay, it could be a person, it could be a cat, it could be a dog, okay? This, this uh, object is cute or not? Can you write a, you know, then you need to collect a lot of pictures, you know, of objects. And then, you know, with label, oh, this is cute, this is not cute, right? But who to label this? It takes a lot of manual work to label this data, right? Because obviously you cannot uh, let the machine to do the labeling. I mean, this, this you know, if the machine can do this labeling, you already have a model to do the job, right? Okay, so, so, so this is like, a, you know, catch 22 a lot of time. You, you, you need a lot of like a lab, I mean, uh, effort to, to label the, the picture, okay? Um, even though, I mean, data collection may be easy, but it, you know, it may be too costly to label, okay? The third one, with such a large network, training would be extremely slow, okay? I mean, when the, train, the training could take a long, long period of time, is there some way to speed up training, okay? After all, like, uh, we are not, we, we, you know, even even the computer hardware improve like uh, year after year, uh, uh, it's still it's still quite annoying. Okay, if, if each training take like a days, right? 
Yeah. So so how do you know uh, what, I mean, what can we do to speed up the training? And last one, a model with millions of parameters with severe risk overfitting. So as I said, we need to know more techniques to fight with overfitting. We already talked a little bit about that, but we, we this chapter in the chapter eleven, we are going to go over these problems and talk about um, you know the solutions or at least like uh, techniques to alleviate this problem. I, I cannot say like uh, those solutions can completely solve the problem. That's just probably is just just not possible. But at least like uh, it will it will it will make the problem, you know, um, alleviate the problem. I mean, to to make it like uh, much better. Okay. So, um, the first one is the vanishing exploding gradient. Okay. So what is vanishing exploding gradient? Okay. So remember, like. Uh, <coughs> In previous chapter, we already talked about how to train the model, right? The, tr the model training in deep learning, you know, like uh, uh, rely on uh, back propagation, right? Back propagation. And back propagation rely on computing the gradient, right? Computing the gradient. Gradient, what is the gradient? Gradient is slope, right? Basically, it's slope. But, uh, uh, a lot of time, okay, you will find that, okay, the gradient, okay, that pass, you know, layer by, uh, back to layer by layer, okay, I mean, from, remember, it's a great, uh, reverse, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, back propagation, it, the, the, from the term, remember, we talk about, okay, we first, like, uh, compute, like, uh, the difference between the, you know, we first feed the, 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 in, the training data into the model, and then we obtain the result from the output, right? And then we, we check, like, uh, the, 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 this output. I mean, we, we, we calculate the, out, the difference between the output and the, the ground truth to determine the gradient, right? And then we will compute this, you know, one layer at a time, backward, okay? to the, the, the first layer, right? So layer by layer, back propagate to the first layer, right? But the, this back propagation, okay, sometimes you will find that, okay, the gradient for each layer becomes smaller and smaller and eventually vanishing. When I, when I say vanish, I mean like it's very close to zero, but when the gradient, when the slope is close to zero, that means what? That means your training will not go anywhere, right? Because the training, okay, the, the, the direction of the training rely on the gradient, right? Okay, but if you don't have a gradient, you don't have a place to go. So your training will stall, it will stop there indefinitely. Okay, so that's the first issue, okay? The other direct, the other possibility is exploding gradient. It's exactly the opposite. Okay, remember, like uh, uh, in the model training, not only we need a gradient, but also the size of the gradient vector determine how far we go for each step, for each iteration. Right? Of course, it's determined not only by that, but also by the learning rate. Right? But at least you guys know like uh, the size of the gradient vector has an impact to how far you go for each, each step, each training step, right? So sometimes, okay, the gradient could become bigger and bigger. So eventually it becomes too big. So, so the, the, the training will do like a, like a like kind of like a jump around you know, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the space. In the in the training space, it will just go like uh, like uh, you know at uh, different places, and it doesn't converge because the gradient becomes too big. We call that exploding gradient problem. Okay, to be honest, okay, vanishing gradient happen more often than exploding one. Okay, the exploding gradient 
normally happens only in certain neural networks, such as RNN, okay, which has, um, because RNN has a feedback mechanism which make uh, the gradient to, to be more likely to explode, okay? But uh, for most of the other neural networks, the, the, the problem mostly, mostly is the vanishing gradient. Okay, so what do we do? What do we do? So this is actually, uh, remember I told you guys like uh, the neural network, uh, um, or I should say like a second wave of the AI died around like a 19, end of 1980s, at the beginning of 1990s, right? And uh, it doesn't, you know, it, 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 you know, the third wave of AI, which is now, okay, it's like, uh, I mean, uh, come back around like, uh, the, around like year 2000, right? I mean, as, as I said, like there are some reasons. One of the reasons is because some small tweaks, right? So those small tweaks has something to do with this, okay? So first, I mean, let me explain the reason for this, uh, when, okay, the vanishing gradient. Remember, like, uh, um, uh, I, 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 I talked about this before, like, uh, the ANN origi originally got the idea from BNN, right, biological neural network. Okay, and the, the activation function in the biological neural network Okay, it's kind of like a, a sigmoid. Okay, sigmoid. So, so sig what? You, you know sigmoid, the shape of sigmoid, right? It's S shape, right? S shape, right? So, on two sides of this function, the gradient, the slope is almost zero, right? Okay, we call such a, you know, phenomenon as saturating, saturating. When a function is saturating, okay, its a gradient is, uh, you know, close to zero, such as here and here. Okay, so, because in the second wave of AI, People still believe in God. No, no. I, I'm saying that like we are still believing in God. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm no religious, uh, you know, incorrectness here. Okay. I mean, because people still think like uh, the AN should uh, follow BN closely. So people, most of them, use sigmoid. Okay, as activation function, and uh, sigmoid function, you can see that when it gets a larger value or smaller value, okay, you are going to get like a close to zero gradient, right? So this is like, a, you know, one of the reasons that contribute to the um, uh, uh, vanishing gradient, okay? So another thing that have been observed, okay, this is like one of the small tricks that uh, actually has uh, important consequence to the third, uh, uh, you know, uh, wave of the AI is that, okay, these two guys, Groro Benjo, especially Benjo. Groro is actually Benjo's student, okay? But Benjo is a nice professor, so he let his student to be the first author because like, uh, this paper has a very important impact. So, uh, so, uh, so this technique is named after his student's name. To be honest, like, uh, this technique should be named after Professor Benchio, but uh, it's named after, um, because his student is uh, Grorod Xavier. So this is called Xavier initialization. So what they found is like this, okay. In the back propagation, in the back propagation, okay, if at that time, back in the old days, okay, people used like, uh, um, you know, Gaussian distribution with uh, average zero, 
uh, uh, you know, standard deviation one. Okay, so basically just like a, you know, the standard Gaussian to initialize the randomly initialize the the, the 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 parameters in the model. Okay, so so this is like a, you know uh, 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 followed. I mean uh, by pretty much everyone. Okay, back to the second uh, wave of AI. But they found that, this is important, they found that if you use this initialization, uh, then when you do the back propagation, the variance, the variance will increase layer by layer. So when the layer increase layer by layer, what does that mean? The value will become more and more fluctuated, right? So when the value become more and more fluctuated, it goes to two, these two ends, right? So it, when it goes to, to these two ends, you are getting no gradient. Okay? So that is the cause of the gradient, uh, vanishing gradient. Okay? Of course, this has to do with two things. First, the, um, the activation function. The second one is the initialization technique at that time. Okay? So, so they, they did some research and then derived that, okay, there are other better initialization techniques. And of course, uh, you know, after that, I mean, people start not to use uh, sigmoid as activation function that much. People use, for example, now they Riru, right? Riru doesn't have that issue, okay, anymore. Okay, so, well, I, I think we don't have time to talk about the Xavier uh, initialization today. So let's uh, stop here today. We'll talk about Xavier initialization next time, okay? Okay, so I'll see you next week, okay? Okay. Okay, let's get started. Okay. Um, so first thing, I uh, uh, just want to remind you, the project number two has been uploaded to the EE class. Okay. So please check it out. Okay. And uh, it's also about time. Uh, that you guys, uh, you know, remember I told you like uh, the final project, uh, for the final project, like, uh, you know, uh, two small group will be combined to form a large one, right? I mean, so it is uh, about time that uh, um, you, you need to, you know, decide like uh, which uh, small group like your group would like to collaborate with for the final project. Uh, I will have the TA to prepare the form uh, to, to collect that information from you, okay? Hopefully, like, uh, before, uh, you know, uh, probably before the due date of the second project, okay? Should be, should be reasonable, okay? Because the, the, the 
final project actually will be announced like uh, um, in another few weeks. It will actually be announced earlier than the third third project. Okay, because uh, the final project is um, supposed to be bigger one, and uh, I expect like uh, uh, you know there are there will be collaboration between groups. Okay, uh, to work on the final project to make it better. Okay. So, okay, come back to the, the lecture, okay. Uh, I hope to be able to finish this uh, chapter in two weeks, and then we will move on to the CNN. Uh, any question? Yes, my wenti ma. Okay. So, Last time, okay, last week we talked about um, an important finding, okay, an important finding um, that like uh, um, if you use uh, the sigmoid or hypertension type of uh, activation along with the um, uh, random initialization uh, with like, a, you know, um, the you know normal distribution with uh, mean zero variation one okay uh, a standard deviation one I'm sorry then what happens that okay in the back propagation the variance okay is going to become bigger and bigger which uh, is the very important reason to contribute to the vanishing gradient problem right so um, uh, the Xavier, okay, or Gorod, okay, Gorod, Xavier Gorod, and uh, ben, Yo, Yosha Benjo, okay, uh, in their paper, okay, they prove this uh, uh, is the reason. In addition, okay, in this paper, they actually propose um, an initialization, which, uh, if you use it along with the sigmoid, okay, activation function, then you can avoid avoid this type of uh, you know like a phenomenon okay um, of course like uh, um, you know um, in fact it's not possible to guarantee okay both uh, you know uh, uh, this this phenomenon from happening okay um, unless the layer has an equal number of input and uh, you know, in, inputs and uh, and uh, the output. Okay, uh, we call that uh, as um, thin in and the thin out of the layer. Okay, so what do we mean by thin in, thin out? Because like uh, you know, for each layer, say this is a layer. Each neuron has some connection to the to the previous layers, right? To a pre the neuron in the previous layer. We call this number, the number of connection for this neuron as thin in. And the thin out is like uh, the number of connection from this neuron to the next, the neuron in the next layer. So this is uh, for the thin out, okay? So basically, okay, if thin in and the thin out are the same, okay, they prove they prove that uh, you know uh, we can avoid this uh, you know uh, variance like an uh, increasing issue okay by using a special initialization okay but if uh, um, we know like uh, uh, we at each level at each layer we may use different number of neurons right it's very common so the thing and thing out in many cases are different, okay? So we cannot completely avoid this, I mean, you know, but uh, they still derive a uh, approximation, okay? Saying, okay, if you, yeah, even if the thing and thing out are different, if you use this uh, initialization, the chance for this uh, variation to increase, I mean, layer by layer, okay, is going to be, you know, reduced. Okay, they call this um, 
Xavier initialization, uh, initialization or Goro initialization. Okay, I mean, well, Xavier and Goro, I mean, it's uh, basically it's the name of the first author. Okay, so what exactly is that? Okay, it's like this. If you use a logistic activation function, well, which basically is a sigmoid, okay, then that thin average to be like uh, the average of the thing and thing out. Here, of course, we are talking about the approximation, okay? In the case that thing in, thing in and thing out values are different, okay? And if you want to use normal distribution to randomly initialize the, the weight, then, okay, uh, you should use mean zero and the standard deviation th like this. I mean, you know, uh, the, the square of the extended deviation to be like a thin average, I mean, uh, one over thin average, okay? Or if you are using a uniform distribution to randomize, uh, randomly initialize your weights, then uh, your value should be in between negative R to positive R, where R is this one, okay? So they say if you use this um, way to initialize your uh, weight, okay, randomly, then, you know, you can tell, like, uh, this is, um, you know, uh, what should I say, like, uh, it is still random, random initialization, it's just like uh, the, 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 the range, the range for this random initialization is different, it's different, and uh, by this, very small tweak, they prove that the chance for this, uh, you know, increasing variance uh, issue, okay, will be alleviated. I'm, be careful, I'm saying alleviated. I didn't say completely gone, okay, because as I say, if you want it to be gone completely, okay, your thing in, thing out value has to be exactly the same. But, uh, when we design neural network a lot of time, I mean, you know, we have different number of neurons between layers. So it is, you know, not very common for thing in, thing out to, to have the same value anyway, okay? So, um, this is something interesting, okay? I want to tell you, remember I keep telling you I say, I mean, I tell you like, uh, Yang Le Chong is, uh, is, is kind of like a god, right? I mean, uh, you, you, you may wonder why, why I keep saying that. I mean, well, Yang Le Chong and uh, Yoshio Benjo, I mean, they, I mean, three of them like uh, received like a tuning award together. So they should have equally contri equal contribution to this uh, uh, AI, you know, uh, uh, technology. Yes, I mean, uh, if, you, if you say that, um, that's true, but, uh, you know, the Yang Le Chong is a kind of a special person who has a very, what should I say, like, a, um, who has a vision, like uh, he can see something that will happen like uh, many, many years later. For example, here, if you replace thin average with thin in, in normal distribution equation, you get an initialization strategy that Yang Le Chong proposed in 1990s, 1990s, when was the, this uh, Xavier initialization being proposed? This was proposed after 2000, after year 2000. Okay, they found out this after year 2000, but Yang Le Chong identified this 10 years earlier than anyone, but he didn't prove it. He just found that, oh, if I do this, well, the, the neural network training will improve a lot. But he, you know, he, he, he has this guts intuition to tell, to, to say, okay, we should do this initialization. So you can see that, okay, in 1990s, he called this Le Chong initialization. So, so back to like more than 10 years ago, he already envisioned such initialization, okay, even without very concrete proof, 
Okay, he did some proving, but not very, uh, very through proof. Of course, the the real proof, okay, was uh, done actually by, by 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 you know, uh, this paper, the Benjo's paper. Okay, so you know, so that's why I keep telling you, okay, this young <coughs> young Chong is really, you know, special, really special. Okay. And uh, you know later on, okay, Chilenvi, uh, okay, or and the Klaus Robert Mueller, okay, they they published a book in 1998, okay, about neural networks, okay, tricks of the trade, okay, and uh, that book include Yang Le Chong's in, uh, uh, initialization technique. And it uh, that book actually like uh, you know you know uh, recommend recommend uh, Yang Le Chong's uh, uh, initialization. So uh, Yang Le Chong's initialization was known, okay, at least by a small number of researchers back to like uh, early days. But it's just, it was just like uh, you know nobody Yang Le Chong was not that. Um, not 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 a big name, okay. They, or let me put it this way, okay. Not not a big name, okay. Back to early nineteen nineties, that is why, okay. His finding was not that uh, you know uh, well known, okay. So if uh, he was uh, a big name professor, maybe like uh, the AI advancement will be will occur maybe like 10 years earlier, okay? So this is, uh, you know, why I keep telling you, okay, Yang Le Chong is, uh, is really something else, okay? So it took over a decade for researchers to realize how important this trick is, okay? So they, they, they will use Glorow initialization, okay? Uh, this initialization not only speed up the training, okay? Uh, it is one of the tricks that led to the success of deep learning. Okay, without this, like uh, as I said, like uh, no, the reason the second AI wave died is was because like uh, everybody know. Okay, we should have like uh, you know multi layers, but uh, the training for like a deep neural network was so difficult with without these small tricks. Okay, so these small tricks, okay, are very very important. Okay. So, hmm? okay, okay. So, some papers they all, or they they provide similar strategies for different activation functions, because as we know, like uh, you know, uh, in the old days, like uh, people use like a sigmoid, okay. But uh, uh, recently, more and more people use like uh, you know, Riru, right? And uh, variant of Riru. I mean, as I will explain, like uh, today, later. Okay, so um, uh, so for different activation function, obviously you should uh, have a, have different initialization strategy. Okay, so um, um, they will show you. Okay, let me let me let me like uh, show you a table. Okay, that list like. Uh, the initialization techniques that you should uh, understand. Okay, so for example, if you use, uh, you know, no initialization or hypertension or logistic softmax, okay, this type of like uh, saturated activation function, then you should use Gorod or Xavier. Okay, if you use like a Riru or a variant. Okay, what is uh, this? Uh, what are these variants stand for? Okay, I will explain later. Okay, so you should use like uh, you know uh, the He initialization. Okay, and uh, which said like uh, is a normal distribution with uh, sigma square to be like two over fan in. Okay, by the way, He is obviously a Chinese name. Okay, this is a ch ch uh, Chinese guy who made I mean also very strong contribution to. AI research um, because obviously we use Riru a lot. I mean, uh, in in the, in the, in the recent years, okay. And Yang Le Chong, okay, 
um, if you use zero, okay, you should use uh, the Chong initialization, which is one over thing in. But uh, so you may wonder what is zero, okay? It's a, uh, um, um, I'll explain this uh, activation function later on, okay? So basically, like uh, for different activation functions, you should use a different uh, um, initialization, way initialization strategy. So um, here, okay, is like, uh, you know, how you write your program in Keras to use different initialization strategy. If you are, by default, Keras use Growroad or Xavier initialization with uniform distribution, okay? But if you are, when creating a layer, if you want to change to her initialization, because we use uh, Riru all the time, right? So you can do something like this, okay? Uh, setting ker kernel initializer equal to her uniform, okay? Or kernel initializer equal to her normal, something like this, okay? Or in this, la in this line, okay? Chaos star layer dot dense, okay? You create 10 neuron with Riru activation, and the, the kernel initializer equal to her normal. Uh, this is for her normal. If you want to use like a, you know, uh, um, um, a different distribution, such as a uniform distribution, you can use her uniform, obviously. Okay, so if you want her initialization with a uniform distribution, but uh, you want to want it to base on thin average, but not thin in, then what happens is like, uh, you can write a program like this. He average INIT, this is just a name, okay? Uh, a variable name, okay? It's uh, that take object that you create by, I mean, from the keras.initializers, that variance scale, scaling, variance scaling. This, this one create a, a initializer uh, uh, for you, okay? And, the, uh, uh, you know, and you need to tell, tell it that what scale it is, it is and uh, the mode, what mode is it is, and what distribution it is, okay? As long as it t you tell them, tell you like uh, correct, like, uh, uh, um, you know, information, it will create an initializer object, okay, here. And uh, when you create a layer, you can assign this uh, um, initializer, okay? Just like, uh, you know, what we have earlier, okay? So that's pretty much about it, okay? So, then it's like uh, um, activation functions, okay? So, um, remember like uh, uh, this uh, uh, um, vanishing gradient issue, okay, was caused, okay, the, the variance keep going up and up and eventually it will, the gradient vanish. It was because like uh, the, um, the um, we have a saturated activation function, right? So when I say saturating activation function, I mean like uh, uh, when the value is either too big or too small, the, the, the derivative is all, almost flat, right? So, um, yeah. So obviously the 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 choice of activation function in the old day also contribute to this uh, vanishing gradient issue. Okay. So so as a result, the sigmoid activation function, okay, I mean uh, well, which was used very often, okay, in the old early day because everybody believed like uh, well it's it's uh, it's a god like a choice to use a sigmoid uh, in biological neurons. So why not, we, we, why not we use the same thing for the artificial neural network, okay? But it turns out to be, to, to be not true, okay? But anyway, anyway, so, so, you know, so if I start to switch to other activation function, obviously one of the good choice will be Riru, right? But Riru also has its issue, okay? Riru also has its issue because we know Riru is like, uh, you know, when uh, the, 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 the input is greater than zero, okay? It is uh, linear, right? But uh, when the input is l smaller than zero, you get a flat line, right? 
it's zero basically, right? So, um, well, so real activation function is, is not perfect, okay? It still suffers from problem known as dying real. So this is also a name, okay? That is uh, well known, okay? It, it's an issue that is well known, okay? What is dying real? Okay, it's like this. During training, some neurons effectively die, okay? Um, meaning they stop outputting anything other than zero other than zero. So in some cases, you may find that half of your network's neurons are dead, especially if you use a large learning rate. Okay, so during training, if a neuron, if, so, so th let's stop here, let's stop here, okay? So about ha half of new neurons will be dead. Why is that? Well, Assuming, because, you know, for real, we know like uh, we are going to get like, uh, you know, a uh, weighted sum from all those inputs, right, of this neuron before we apply real, right? Okay, assuming this weighted sum has the same, ha has equal, has a very, you know, uh, flat distribution. Okay, very uh, yeah, uniform distribution across like uh, all the values. Then think about this. Okay, you get half of the chance for a neuron, okay, to get a negative in, like a uh, weighted sum, right? Because well, uh, for 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 real line, you have a half half of a real line to be positive and half of a real line to be negative, right? So you know, assuming you, you can get any value from this weighted sum, then on average, you get, you have 50% of the chance that this weighted sum turn out to be smaller than, smaller than zero, right? If it's smaller than zero, the real, when you apply the real, okay, you get zero, right? You get zero, okay? So, so that's, that is why, okay, about half of the neurons may die, okay? S statistically, this is, uh, you know, very uh, uh, natural, right? Very natural. But uh, it will, you know, uh, but the, the issue is, uh, you know, um, the, so during training, if a neuron's weights get updated such that the weight when the sum of the neurons input is negative, it will start outputting zero. So we, that's exactly what I just mentioned, okay? Then we know about that, okay? And this is, this contribute to like a half of neuron will, will be dead, okay? The one of the, I mean, the part of, I mean, part of reason. But the, when this happens, the neurons is unlikely to come back to life since the gradient of the Real function is zero when its input is negative. So, because we know the shape of real is like this, right? Here it's flat. So when you are here, you 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 don't have gradient to move, okay, you don't have a gradient to move. You may argue, okay, yeah, I mean, we got this uh, weighted sum, like, uh, you know, this to be negative this time, but in the next round, maybe you are, we, are go we are not going to get a no, negative from this weighted sum anymore, right? But uh, keep in mind, okay, so if this is a neuron, okay, it, it receives value from the lower layers. Okay, if it's negative, if this weighted sum is negative, okay, and assume like half of the neurons in the next, in, 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 in the next layer is negative too. I, I, mean, I mean, so, so half of this neuron will output zero, right? Okay, because they, we all, we use the uh, real all the, I mean, all the way, right? I mean, for, for all the layers. So, 
So half of these uh, neurons may output zero as well. So, so the chance for the, 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 the rest of the half of the re, re, uh, neurons in the previous layer to, to output something that help you to escape from this uh, neg negative weighted sum, okay, it's not that high. It's not necessarily very high, okay. So, so a lot of time, okay, when, you know, you get a negative value, uh, uh, you will stay there, okay. So the neuron is unlikely to come back to life, okay. And uh, we have this, uh, you know, dying rule. I'm not saying this dying rule happens like all the time, but yeah, it is an issue that we need to consider, okay. So to solve this problem, okay, you want to use a variant of Riru function, okay. A famous family of the, you know, variant is called leaky Riru. Okay, what is leaky Riru? Leaky Riru is defined as like this. Leaky Riru, okay, alpha, z, okay, z is the input, okay, the, the or uh, weighted sum, okay. It's a max of alpha z, z, okay, and uh, uh, this alpha is normally a small number, small positive number. So the leaky rule, okay, the shape, okay, is going to be, you know, because this alpha, as I say, it's a small positive number, okay, maybe 0 0.001, okay, something like that, okay. So if z is positive, obviously z is greater than alpha z, right? If, if z is positive, okay, then obviously z is greater than alpha z because alpha is a small, is a value smaller than, than one, right? Okay, so, so um, it, when the input is greater than one, uh, than zero, okay, you get, it's going to be the same as the real, okay? But when, when z is smaller than zero, okay, then what happens is that alpha z is bigger than z. So it's going to be something like this. This is the shape of leaky real. Okay, when the value, when the weighted sum is greater than zero, well, it's a, it's a same linear function, but when the weighted sum is lower than zero, it is also a linear function, but it's, um, it has a very small, uh, uh, um, you know, um, slope, very small slope. This slope equal to this alpha. Okay, and we, we, this, this one, okay, uh, this phenomenon, okay, is considered as leaky, okay, as leaky. So this is uh, why this function gets the name leaky real, okay. So, so, so what is the advantage of leaky real over real? You can see obviously, okay, yeah, when the weighted sum is negative. If you use leaky rule, you still get a gradient, right? Even though the gradient may be small because this alpha value is a very, very small positive number. So, yeah, I mean, so your gradient is small. But uh, that's fine because uh, eventually, okay, uh, uh, you know, even if you have a small gradient. This small gradient eventually can help you, you know, recover from the dead status, okay? So, so that's, that is, this uh, small slope, small gradient is very important. So, you know, and, uh, you know, the, this alpha is typically said to be 0 0.01. Sometimes it, it can be I mean, different value, but uh, you know, it's no, it's always like a small positive value, basically. Okay, so you can, you know, your leaky rule never die 
they may go into a long coma. Okay, coma just means like uh, it's yun dao, okay, faint, okay. But eventually they will have a chance to wake up, okay. So there are actually many variants of the Riru function, okay. Here we are going to talk about several of them, okay. A recent paper compares several variants of Riru activation function. And one of its conclusions was the leaky variant always outperformed the strict Riru activation function. So you can see that Riru, okay, if you, you know, if you want to use Riru, okay, you may as well use leaky Riru, okay. So in fact, setting alpha to be 0 0.2, a larger leak will result in better performance than a small leak such as 0 0.01 okay so this paper tell you okay a larger leak sometimes will get a better performance than a small uh, uh, alpha value okay and they also evaluate other variant of RIRU activation function such as random leaky RIRU so what is random leaky RIRU okay it's a previous as R, R RIRU okay where alpha is picked randomly in a given range during training. So Riru, in this uh, random Riru, uh, random, random leaky Riru, okay, um, alpha is maybe picked between 0 and the 1, okay, as a random number, okay. In every uh, iteration, in every iter iteration, okay, but of course that's for like uh, training, okay, and uh, it is fixed to an average value during testing, okay. Um, so, in the testing, okay, if uh, so, let's say if the range is between zero and one, uh, then during testing you may set it to be zero point five, okay, as um, as average value, okay. So. It also performed fairly well and it seemed to act as a regularizer. Okay, so the randomized uh, 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 leaky Riru, okay, um, can you know also help you to uh, fight with overfitting. Okay, so this is a very good. Uh, it has a very good uh, you know property. Okay, so another one. Okay. They have, I mean, there's uh, another variant called parametric leaky Riru, P Riru, okay, where alpha is authorized to be learned during training. So alpha is a one additional learnable variable uh, parameter, learnable uh, parameter in the network, okay. So it can be modified by prop by propagation, okay, like any other parameters, okay? So um, this uh, parametric leaky Riru, okay, is, um, is, a, is a something like this. So it becomes, uh, um, you know, this, is, this was uh, reported to strongly outperform Riru on large image data set. So if your data set is huge, P Riru is, uh, I mean, has a very good performance, okay. But, but, now, because uh, you, in, uh, obviously, you, you, you increase the number of parameters, right? When you increase the number of parameters, you know, it means you increase the complexity of the model, right? So, if your data set is not large enough, you run the risk to overfit the model, okay? Because when, when I say, I mean, wh what happens when the model overfit? Okay, your model is too complicated. Okay, it, it captured a small variation of your, it should, you should, oh, we should only capture the trend of the data, but it captured a small variation of the data set, which caused the overfitting, right? So, 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 you know, so in some sense, this uh, P Riru and the R Riru are opposite to each other. Okay, but both p 
perform better. Both actually perform better than Riru. Okay, um, but the uh, R Riru help you to fight with overfitting. P Riru okay may cause overfitting. So which one to use? Okay, so this is the uh, you know leaky Riru as I said. You have a small gradient here. Okay. Which Riru to use? Okay, we are going to talk about this. Okay, very quick. Uh, you know, in the next slide. Okay, so so here, okay, we would like to introduce one more uh, variation of uh, Riru. Okay, so there's a paper, okay, published in 2015. Okay, that proposed a new activation function called exponential linear unit, or abbreviated as ELU. <laughs> This ELU was, I mean, you know, it outperformed all the real variants in their experiments. Okay, the training was reduced, uh, and the neural network performed better on the test set. Okay, so, so what is this uh, ELU? ELU looks like this: when the z greater than zero, greater or equal to zero, it's just z. Just uh, so it's a uh, when the z is greater greater than zero, it's it's the same as Riru. But uh, when z is smaller than zero, it's, uh, it's something like this. It's alpha times this uh, expz minus one. This alpha value, okay, is uh, adjustable, but uh, a lot of time we set it to be one. Okay, we set it to be one. So the, the, it looks like this. When when the 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 weighted sum is smaller than zero, okay, it, eventually it's it's going to you know get get like as close to negative one as possible, okay. But uh, here, okay, uh, it, I mean the shape is uh, is slightly um, uh, different. So um, so it takes a negative value when z is smaller than so, which allows you to have an average. Output closer to zero. Okay, so remember I told you like uh, one of the reason, one of the reason, this uh, uh, sigmoid activation function create like uh, you know will, will increase the variance. Okay, I mean it's because its average. It's going to be 0 0.5. Remember, I told you about this. The average is 0 0.5. So, so the output, okay, the output of, I mean, of the average is uh, uh, 0 0.5. So you can see that, okay, if you if you initialize starting from like uh, you know the v average is zero, I mean, I mean start from zero, so it's going to out increase the output, right? So, so because because the average. You know, this this one is zero. This one is one, right? So average is zero point five, and uh, the similar problem happened for the Riru, right? So no matter it's a Riru or sticky Riru, if you consider the average, it's going to be much larger, right? So it is also possible to make uh, um, the variance to increase, but. Um, if uh, we consider the ELU, yeah, this part is positive, but this part, now we get negative values, right? So these negative values help to cancel out some of this large positive value. So the average is no longer that big, okay? We are able to pull the average back a little bit. So this will help you to a little bit in, you know, uh, uh, in the direction of reducing the the variance, okay. I mean, for each, I mean, for I mean, layer by layer, okay. And also, okay. It has a non-zero gradient when when you when you, your weighted sum is uh, smaller than zero, okay. So which avoid the dying dying real, right? And the function is also smooth everywhere, okay. Uh, originally, for the Riru, we know like uh, you know, the when z is zero, it's a turning 
that that point is a turning point. I mean, it is non-differentiable. But the 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 EOU, okay. <coughs> this uh, place is differentiable, so which is nice. Okay, um, you, you you don't have that issue. Okay, so it does not bounce as much left and the right. Uh, when I mean when you close to when the every, the weighted sum is close to z uh, close to zero. Okay, so so there are so many advantage. Okay, for EOU. So what is the drawback? What is the drawback? There's no, well, n not too many. Okay, free lunch anyway. Okay, so the so main drawback of the EOU activation function is that it is slower to compute than the ReRU and its variant, because I mean, no matter which ReRU variant that we talk about, okay, ReRU, leaky ReRU. P ReRU, R ReRU, okay. I mean, they are all linear function, right? Linear function. No matter it's uh, z is greater than zero or z is smaller than zero, okay. Basically, it's a linear function, right? So linear function obviously are much fast to compute, right? Okay. But uh, this uh, EOU, okay, because uh, when Z is smaller than zero. Okay, this one require you to compute exponential value. It takes longer time to compute this part. Okay, so the, it, it it is um, you know it is like uh, the disadvantage of this uh, uh, activation function. Okay, so during training, this is compensated by faster convergence rate. So, uh, if you use EOU, yeah, it takes longer time uh, to compute. But uh, maybe, okay, if you use EOU, originally maybe you only you, you require like, uh, um, they say, 100 epochs, 100 iterations to train a neural network. But if you use EOU, maybe you only need 20. So, even though for each iteration it takes more time. But uh, you know, um, it's um, you know, the total training time is reduced. Okay, so however, at test time, an EOU network will be slower than ReLU network. So if you use re EOU network to do inference, to do inference after the training, okay, it is going to be slower after all because because it takes more time to compute this activation function. Okay. So now we have, uh, uh, you know, we, we are we arrived like uh, the the place to introduce the CRU. Okay, it is called scale, sc scaled ELU. So it's a variant of ELU function. Okay. It's a scaled variant of ELU activation function. So this paper, okay. So what is important about this zero activation function? This zero activation function, okay, has a very very nice, very nice uh, property, okay. Okay, if all hidden layers use zero activation function, then the network will self normalize. What does that mean? It means if your input is normalized, okay, and uh, it goes through like a zero layer, okay, it guarantees that the output will stay normalized, okay, with uh, you know with a every zero and a variance one maybe, so a, a steady variation one, okay, during training. So so it, it's a very nice, okay, because it completely you know, uh, re solve the issue of that, uh, you know, the increasing uh, uh, variance problem, okay? So, okay, so which solve the vari vanishing exploring gradient problem, okay? So, as a result, the zero activation function often significantly outperforms other activation function for such uh, for such neural network, 
okay, especially deep ones. So there are, however, a few conditions for self-normalization to happen. So, so if you want to use zero, okay, you need to you need to make sure, okay, this uh, property, okay, these uh, these uh, conditions are met, okay. The first one, the input features must be standardized, okay. So you have to, you know, first normalize your input in order to guarantee its output will be normalized, okay? The input obviously has to be normalized first. And second, every hidden layer's weight must be initialized with the Chong normal initialization. So you just need to follow the Chong uh, initialization, okay? So just set the kernel initializer to be the Chong normal. This is very easy, okay? The third one, the network architecture must be sequential, okay? You can only have one path. Um, so, for example, uh, 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 for non-sequential architecture, such as recurrent neural networks, okay, because recurrent neural network has like feedback mechanism, so it is not sequential. It is not sequential. Or, remember, we talked about the skip connection, okay, in the uh, in the in the wide and deep ne neural network. Remember we talked about that, right? So, so that skip connection, okay, make the, 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 the model, okay, not sequential. So if your model is not sequential, okay, something like uh, RNN or something like uh, this, uh, you have skip connection, then zero will not necessarily outperform other activation functions, okay? Because zero doesn't guarantee self-normalization anymore, okay, in non-sequential function, okay. And one last thing, the paper only guarantees self-normalization if all layers are dense. But some researchers have noted that zero activation function also improves performance in CNN, okay. So in CNN, you can also use Real uh, zero, okay. You can also use zero. Um, yeah, we are going to talk about the next chapter, okay. So, just work for your information. So, so now, okay, we have so many different um, elevation function, right? In addition to sigmoid, uh, hypertension, logistic, okay, uh, those old ones. Now we have Riru, leaky Riru, P Riru, R Riru. E L U zero. So which one to use? Which one is uh, is is better in what in what condition? So we are going to talk about that. Okay. Uh, well, let's take ten minutes break. Okay. After that, we'll, let's talk about this. Leak. For P Riru, replace leaky Riru. Okay, with P Riru, and that's it. Okay. But for R Riru, okay, the randomized leaky Riru, the current keras doesn't have uh, official implementation, okay. But uh, it can, you can implement it. I mean, by yourself, fairly easily, okay. Um, there's like an exercise at the end of chapter twelve that teach you how to do that. Actually, the textbook okay provide a solution for all the exercises uh, in the. Uh, 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 you know um, the um, uh, um, the 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 notebook in the notebook. Okay, if I rem but I forgot like where to download it. Okay, I mean there. If you check out the, the textbook, okay, uh, at the preface, okay, somewhere, okay, tell you like uh, where you can download the the uh, Jupyter notebook uh, for all the exercise uh, for the solution for all the exercises so you can you can you can follow that, that uh, um, to to see how you can write the code and the implementation for the the randomized leaky Riru. okay so for zero activation okay uh, there's like a zero activation uh, that's already provided by the keras okay so just kernel initial i mean just set elevation to be zero and the kernel initializer to be the chong normal. That's it. 
okay, so it's, it's something like this. Okay, elevation zero, current initializer, initializer that's shown normal, that's it. Okay, so, so now, okay, we finish the initialization strategy and uh, the activation, different uh, type of activation functions, okay? And we are moving on to the next uh, topic, which is uh, batch normalization, okay? So we know like uh, using he initialization along with EOU or any variant of RIRU, okay, can significantly reduce the vanishing exploding gradient problems at the beginning of the training. So it doesn't guarantee that they won't come back during training, okay? So this only, you know, uh, 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 sort of like uh, reduce the vanishing and exploding gradient problem from happening, okay? Um, the only one that is more safe from these problems is Ciru, okay? But Ciru is restricted by the network architecture, okay? If your network architecture doesn't allow you to use Ciru for self-normalization, then, well, I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean, there's no, currently no better uh, 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 way, okay? I mean, to, to prevent this, uh, this problem from happening completely, okay? To completely prevent the problem from happening. Okay, it's just like uh, it reduced the chance that this problem happens, but uh, it, it may still come back. So in a 2015 paper, this is a very important one, okay? Sergey Lov, Lov and uh, Christian uh, Zgetti, okay? These two uh, researchers, they propose a technique called batch normalization, BN, okay? To address the vanishing exploding gradient problems. And more generally, the problem that uh, the distribution of each layer's input changes during training. Okay, uh, so uh, for example, in the, um, um, in the Xavier Gorod and uh, Yoshio Benjo's paper, they say it's, uh, uh, they didn't give a, a particular name for this uh, problem, but uh, you know, in this paper, in, the, in their uh, Sergio Lofi and uh, Christian Zgetti, okay, uh, paper, they gave this name, okay, called internal covariate shift problem. But basically it's uh, exactly the same problem as what like, uh, uh, you know, um, Xavier uh, paper pointed out, okay, exactly the same. So, but of course, the important thing is not about the name of the problem. The important thing is about what the solution these two researchers propose this batch normalization, okay. So, um, the, the idea, okay, uh, uh, is like this, okay. They add operation in the model just before the activation function of each layer, okay. So what operation to add, okay. They just zero centering and uh, normalizing the input, okay. So yeah, I mean, um, because you, the, 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 for each layer, the, the, the variant become bigger and bigger, right? So, well, we want to fight with this issue. So very simple, we just, in each layer, we just, you know, we just uh, try to, you know, uh, uh, just, uh, you know, zero centering and normalize the, the input, okay? Then we introduce two additional vari uh, I mean, uh, a parameter called scaling the shifting. Okay, we're just scaling the shifting the result using two new parameters per layer. Okay, one for scaling, one for shifting. Okay, so in other words, this operation lets the model learn the optimal scale and the mean of the input for each layer. Okay, so it doesn't you know, it first like a pull back. It first pull back to make sure like a, the, the model, I mean for each batch, okay, the, the computation, okay, it doesn't, 
you know, the variance doesn't grow, okay, bigger and bigger, okay? But, um, <coughs> but they also introduced like uh, this scaling and the shifting parameter to make sure like, uh, you know, each layer has the proper, um, you know, scale and, uh, and, uh, and uh, average, okay? So in many cases, if you add a BN layer as the very first layer of your normal ne neural network, you do not need to standardize your training set because the, this uh, BN basically, I mean, do the uh, normalization uh, as for you, okay, or, or, I mean, already. And the BN layer will do it for you, okay? So, and also, okay, um, so how does it, how does it work, okay? Let's look at this, okay. So it's like this, okay. This, uh, this basically runs for like uh, all the instances in a batch, okay. Most likely it's a mini batch, okay. So for one mini batch, okay, this X stands for like uh, a particular um, uh, um, you know, feature, particular feature. So we just like uh, add up all um, this feature, you know, for this batch, and then you know, I mean, to do the, I mean, do the average. So we, we get the average of this of this uh, feature in this batch, and we compute the variance, uh, the standard deviation, okay, for this batch. Okay, for this for this uh, feature in this batch, okay, and then okay, you can see. We try to okay for each for each uh, input. We try to you know, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, minus the you know, you know uh, the mu b. Okay, so we ju just try to zero centering. Okay, make sure the average becomes zero, and also we you know divide this by the standard deviation. I mean square. Square root of I mean I mean well square root of the sigma stars uh, sigma square so it's a standard deviation so make sure like uh, well the the standard deviation becomes like a one okay of course we add a sigma here okay I mean a little bit sigma here just to make sure okay the 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 uh, denominator can never be zero okay denominator can never be zero because. I mean, this square already guarantees uh, greater than, greater or equal to zero. Uh, greater or equal to yeah, to zero. So we add uh, something a little small number just to make sure this is never zero. And then okay, um, we here we introduce okay, a gamma and the beta. So this beta becomes the new average. Gamma is a new is a scaling parameter. Okay that uh, scale your input, okay? So this gamma and the beta are additional parameters introduced per layer, okay? But uh, you can see we, we first normalize, I mean, the features, okay? And then we intro introduce gamma and beta, okay? And this gamma and beta are learnable, okay? In the sense that we want, um, the neural network, the back propagation to learn the optimal gamma and the beta value for, for each layer, okay, for us, okay? So during training, being standardized is input, then scaling scales and offsets them. So what about at test time? Okay, this is interesting, okay, at test time. Because, okay, during training, okay, in the training we have, uh, we have a, a concept of a, of a batch, right? Okay, and you compute the uh, average and uh, standard deviation from that batch. But uh, at the test time or during inference, okay, we, we, we don't have a batch, okay? In a test, uh, during inference, we may only use this model to inference one or two instances, right? So how do you have like uh, the average or like a uh, uh, standard deviation for only a few instances? Okay, there's there's no way to compute like uh, each input mean and standard deviation. Okay, moreover, if 
if we, even if we do have a batch of instances, it may be too small. All the instances may not be independent and identically distributed. It's not IID, so, so the computing statistics over the batch instances would be unreliable, okay? So what do we do? Okay, one solution is like, uh, you know, after we finish the training, we run the, 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 narrow, the, the network through the whole training set, okay? To compute the mean and the standard deviation um, for the whole data set, okay? Then we use this final, uh, 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 you know, average and the standard deviation for the future inference, okay? For the predictions. This is one way. But, you know, this is not, uh, not used like uh, in, in most of the situation. In most of the situation, okay, we use moving average to compute, to, to, you know, to estimate like uh, the, the final statistics during training. Okay, what is moving average? <laughs> Uh, you guys understand the mini batch, right? Okay, the mini batch is like, say we have like a, we, we have a class like this, right? So each time I take like a 10 students to do training, randomly take two, 10 students to do training. Okay, so this is like a, the 10 student is a, the mini batch that I'm talking about, okay? So, so now let's say, okay, I want to compute the, the average, uh, say we, we, we take an exam, final exam, okay, and everybody knows your final score, final exam score. And I want to get the average for this whole class. But I do not want to, you know, no, just, just collect like uh, the, the score from everyone and do the average. You know, I just want to, what I want to do is like, uh, you know, uh, during the mini batch process, I would like to, you know, collect some information and uh, use that to estimate the average for the whole class. <laughs> Can I do that? Each time I randomly take 10 students. Okay, say, each time, okay, this time I took like uh, 10 students, I got the average of these 10 students, say it's uh, 70. And in the next mini batch, I will take another 10 students, right? And then, okay, say, those, the second, in the second batch, second mini batch, the the second, I mean, the 10 students average, say, 65. So I'm going to, what I'm going to do is like, uh, I'm going to, you know, uh, do some, some average, okay, and use that to, to represent the average of the whole class I have so far. So normally it's like, uh, you know, uh, maybe like a, uh, it's going to be 65, 0. No, if it's average, just 0. 0.5 times 6.5, 65 plus 0. 0.5 times 70, right? That's the average. But uh, in fact, what, what we normally do is like something like this: 0. 0.1 times 65 plus 0. 0.9 times 70. This 70 is the current average that I I have for the estimation of the whole class. So this is the current estimation. This is like, a, okay, uh, what I got, like a new input. And I, I can do this many batch many, many times, many, many times. And eventually, okay, this is going to stabilize, okay, and it's going to stabilize into the average of the whole class.
Okay. If you don't believe me, you can write a program to test it. This is this concept is called moving average. Okay. It's called moving average. Okay. So basically like uh, you have an estimate for the whole class. And uh, uh, and in the, in the next you, you get some some samples from this uh, population, and you have a new estimation. Okay, so and then you do like a certain combination. Okay, linear combination of this um, these two values. Normally, because uh, your estimation normally comes from a larger sample, so you have, you are going to put more weight for this uh, uh, current estimation. Okay, and then each time you just you just keep doing this you know, iteratively, repeatedly, for many, many iterations. And eventually, this is going to, you know, stabilize. This is going to, you know, uh, converge into the average of the whole class. Okay? Same thing can be done uh, to compute the, the, the standard deviation. Okay? Can be done for the standard deviation. So, so we could use, like, uh, this... Uh, Moving average, okay, um, to compute the, uh, to estimate, okay, to estimate the average and the standard deviation of the whole population, okay. It may not look, you know, uh, obvious to you, but uh, we can hide this computation during the mini batch process. And uh, to get like um, the, this job done, okay. So without the need of like uh, you know uh, uh, running the, the 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 I mean the whole data set through the network again, okay. At the end of the training, okay. So this is like um, you know what we can do, okay. So this Lofi and the Sgeti they demonstrated that batch normalization considerably improved all the deep, deep neural networks they experiment with, okay? To a certain point, okay, okay. So leading to a huge improvement in the ImageNet classification task. At a, at a time of uh, uh, when they wrote the paper, the ImageNet classification is the, the most challenging image classification task Okay, uh, but of course now, I mean, it is no longer that, that's, that difficult, okay. ImageNet is a large database of image class classified into many classes. If I remember, it's like uh, 1,000 classes, 1,000 classes. And they have this, ima this image uh, database is huge, okay. So commonly used to evaluate computer vision systems, okay. So this, this is like a, a problem famous problem like uh, in the old day. We are going to talk about this again when we talk about CNN, okay? So the vanishing gradient problem was strongly reduced to a point that they could even use saturating activation functions such as hypertension and the logistic activation function. So if they use batch normalization, okay, they can use uh, even hypertension logistic or sigmoid without worrying about the vanishing gradient problem. So this is a very, very strong, very, very powerful technique, okay? So the network were also much less sensitive to the weight initialization. So even if you don't use a particular weight initialization, it's still fine, it's still fine. So the authors were able to use much larger learning rates significantly speeding up the learning process, okay? So specifically, okay, they, they have this, okay? Applied to a state-of-the-art image classification model, batch normalization achieves the same accuracy with 14 times fewer training steps. 14 times, not, not 14 steps fewer. 14 times fewer training steps, okay? So if the original need like one, 140 times, 140 epochs. Now we only need 10 epochs to get a job done. 
okay, and beats the original model by a significant margin. So using an ensemble of batch normalized networks, we improve upon the best published result on ImageNet classification, reaching 4.9% top five validation error. Okay, I mean, you may not understand what is top five validation error. That's fine. Just understand, this 4.9%, okay, top five validation error, uh, and the 4.8 test error exceeding the accuracy of human rater, okay? Even the, if you let a human to do the image classification, the top five error will be higher than their model, okay? Of course, this is, may not be a, a, a news nowadays. We, we all know like a, a lot of, in a lot of tasks, like a deep learning model is able to outperform human, right? I mean, nowadays everybody thinks it's uh, nature, but this paper was published in 2015, seven, seven years ago, okay? So at that time, okay, I mean, they still think like a, a lot of tasks, okay? Human are better, okay, than the deep learning model, okay? So, okay, in addition to uh, uh, these benefits, okay? Batch normalization also acts like a regularizer, okay? Reducing the need for other regularization techniques. For example, dropout, okay? Dropout, we are going to talk about that later in this chapter, okay? We are going to talk about dropout, okay? So batch normalization, however, adds some complexity to the model, okay? Because we need to do some additional computation, even though those computations are not that many, okay? But still, like, it adds a little bit more com uh, complexity to, to the model, okay? So, um, you know, there's a runtime penalty. The neural, neural network makes slower predictions due to extra computations required at each layer because at each layer we need to do this uh, you know the 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 you know shift and uh, you know uh, um, uh, division additional division the shift and uh, you know um, this uh, additional operation take a little bit additional time okay so um, fortunately it's often possible to fuse the BN layer with the previous layer after training Okay, thereby avoiding the wrong time penalty. What does that mean? Okay, say like, uh, okay, if you want to do like, uh, you know, the zero center and uh, divide like uh, um, uh, this layer by like uh, a certain number, okay, to, to, to make like uh, the standard deviation to be, to be one, okay, um, you, can, you can actually, you know, combine this into the previous layer, okay? Because this operation, after all, are linear, right? And the, your, your activation function and everything, that, uh, like uh, the weighted sum, all these are linear as well. So basically you can combine this, com I mean, com you know, computation in the previous layers, okay? Just change the weight. For example, okay, if you need to divide this by, by 10, Okay, say like uh, you need to scale it, okay, to divide by 10. Then in a way, you just reduce the weight by 10, maybe, by 10 times. Then you, 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 can, you can achieve the same result without the need of the extra computation. Okay, so here we talk about that detail, but I think like this is, uh, you know, relatively easy to understand, okay. And, uh, you know, um, there's a TF light optimizer will do this automatically for you, okay? But uh, we, we don't have time to talk about this uh, TF light, I mean, which is uh, specifically used for like an uh, embedded system, okay? But um, um, yeah, I mean, if you are interested, you can, you can check it out, chapter 19, okay, for this, uh, um, for this type of stuff, okay? So, so and also, if you incorporate BN, you will find like uh, the training is uh, slow because 
that each epoch take much more time. Okay, when you use uh, batch normalization, because the additional operations that will cost like uh, more time. Okay, to to process, but uh, okay, this is usually counterbalanced by the fact that convergence is much faster with BN. Remember, like uh, uh, the number of iterations is reduced by more than ten times, right? Okay, so eventually, okay, um, you know, um, it will take fewer epoch to reach the same performance. So all in all. War time will usually be shorter. War time for the training, okay, will be shorter. Okay, this is time measured by the clock on your wall. Okay, so the in re, for example, say like uh, if each each epoch take more time, each epoch each epoch take twice as much time as uh, twice as much time as previous, but uh, you only need like uh, you no know, one tenth of the epochs, so you still you are still faster than. Five times faster, right? Okay, so it's it's going to be something like that. Okay, so so it's it's still worth uh, uh, you know uh, a lot to use like batch normalization. Okay, so as with most things with scales, implementing batch normalization is very simple and intuitive. Okay. Just add batch normalization layer before or after each hidden layer's activation function. So something like this. Okay, let's just look at the code. Okay, so we use like uh, the fresh MIST again as an example. So input shape is 28, 28, right? So then, okay, we add keras dot layers dot batch normalization, and we have this uh, dense layer. Okay, and then uh, here we use E or U, and uh, we use the her, her normal. Okay, initializer, and we have like batch normalization again, and another dense layer and another batch normalization and then output layer. So something like this. So easy, right? Adding batch normalization is so easy in uh, Keras. Okay, if you use a uh, uh, PyTorch, it's going to be something similar. Okay, very easy. Okay. Of course, like uh, the papers say like uh, you should apply batch normalization just before activation function if that's, um, you know, if, if you want to do that, um, let me, here, okay, then it's going to be, you know, first you get a 28, 28, and then you apply batch normalization, and then, okay, you introduce this dense layer, but here, be very careful. You don't use activation function, okay? You don't use activation function because you want to apply batch normalization before you apply the, 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 the activation function. So this is like, a, if you want to implement exactly just like what the uh, paper suggests, okay? The paper in 2015, okay? The Z Zgetti paper suggests then it's go going to be something like that, okay? You apply batch normalization and then activation. Uh, batch normalization and then activation. But here, okay, you, you need to use bias equal to false, okay, if you um, want to do it this way. But um, uh, you will find that, okay, in most of the case, uh, you know, you can apply batch normalization either like this or like this. It doesn't affect the performance of the model a lot anyway, okay? So either way, it should be fine, should be fine, okay? So this one is like you apply the, the EOU first and then batch normalization, okay? So which one to use? I mean, it's uh, really up to you, okay? You can try either one to see which one perform better, okay? And here we just want to show you, okay? Uh, you know, number of parameters, okay? And uh, you can see uh, in the batch normalization, we have this, uh, you know, 3,000 parameters. And uh, this batch normalization will have 1,200, 1,200 parameter. And we have third batch normalization, normalization with like 400 parameters. 
and uh, basically, uh, I think that's probably easier. I mean, you can see um, for each neuron, okay, we have four additional parameters in the batch normalization because the the previous layer neuron has three three hundred, right? So three three hundred times four, we have like twelve hundred, okay. So same thing, okay. This one is difficult to see, but uh, uh, because the previous layer we have like uh, in the input layer is uh, um, this uh, 28 by 28, 700 something, right? 700 something multiply four. That's that's uh, this uh, 3136. Okay, because remember for each neuron, okay, we have four parameters. What four parameters? Here, we have this mu b sigma b uh, square, and uh, we have this uh, uh, gamma and the beta. We have these four parameters, okay? But th these four parameters are not all learnable, okay? Because the mu and the sigma are computed from the batch instances, right? So they are not learnable. They are not learnable. Of course, gamma and the beta are learnable. Gamma and beta are learnable. But the mu and the sigma are not learnable. So that's why, okay? So for example, okay, you can see, okay, half of this are learnable. Half of these are non-learnable. And same thing, half of these are learnable, half of these are non-learnable, half of these are learnable, half of these are non-learnable. So the total you can see, oh, uh, trainable, okay, learnable, trainable, same thing, okay. So trainable parameter is this, mark, this many, but we have non-trainable parameter, which is 2,368. This 2,368 comes from half of uh, this plus half of this plus half of this. You can do the math yourself, okay? Because those are uh, mu and the sigma, the, th those parameters are computed by the batch, okay? So they are, they are not trainable, they are not trainable, okay? And uh, you can see each BN layer adds four parameters, so I, I just already explained this, okay? So we can look at the parameters of the first BN layer Two are trainable, okay, and the two are not trainable, okay. And the trainable ones can be adjusted by back propagation, and the non trainable are not affected by back propagation. So you can see here, okay, the, the gamma, beta are trainable. So, so we have true, I mean, they are, they are said to be true. So the other, like uh, moving mean to be false, and uh, moving variance to be false. These two are the mu and the sigma, sigma, and these two are the gamma and the, and, and the beta. I mean that that's uh, presented in the in the e equation, okay. And also, okay, we have like additional um, operations, okay, for each mini batch because remember we need to estimate the average and the standard deviation for the whole data set. Remember. I just mentioned like uh, those moving average concept, right? So for, for each batch, we need to do additional computation, which is like, uh, you know, presented here, okay? So I already finished this part. So, um, so the batch normalization class has quite a few hyperparameters you can tweak, okay? So default normally will be fine, okay? You normally don't need to tweak them, okay? But you may occasionally need to tweak uh, such as uh, momentum, okay? This hyperparameter is used by batch normalization layer where it updates the exponential moving average given a new value v. This is like uh, to compute the average and the standard deviation for the whole data set. Remember something like this. So this, this one, this one is the V that I'm talking about here, okay? 
this is called exponential moving average. Okay, so uh, so it's a v times momentum plus v times uh, v hat times momentum plus v times one minus momentum. Okay, so this this momentum. Okay, this this v hat is like the current estimation for the whole population. This v is the whatever like uh, I mean you get from this batch of sample. Okay, and uh, this momentum, as I said, like uh, you know, normally it's like a, a, a big number, uh, a number close to z close to one, a good value, no, a number close to one, such as 0 0.9, 0 0.99, something that like that. Okay, basically you want more nines for larger data set and the smaller mini batches. Okay, because smaller mini batch just means they are the new uh, set of instances. Uh, very are uh, not that trustworthy, so you will get like uh, you are trying to get uh, put like a uh, lower weight to it because say if it's like a 0 0.999, then uh, you, you you put this one for here for the current estimate uh, for for the current estimate. So uh, the, the 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 one that you get for the new sample because it's uh, compared to like uh, the whole population, this one is uh, relatively small, right? So this is a little bit more, what should I say, not, sta not that stable. So one minus, for, exa for example, 0 0.99, this, this weight is much lower, right? Something like that. Okay. There's another hyper, uh, hyperparameter called the axis. Uh, well, let's take 10 minutes break. When we come back, we will continue the discussion of this, okay? We're almost done with the batch normalization, anyway. There's also like a, another hyperparameter that you can tune, okay? In uh, the um, um, batch normalization, basically, okay, it, it uh, control like uh, you know how you what what data you normalize okay so the default of this axis okay is said to be negative one meaning that by default it will normalize the last axis okay using the mean and standard deviation computed across other axis okay so uh, you know of course, like, uh, you know, if your input is one-dimensional, for example, like, uh, um, you know, uh, 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 um, a simple case, okay, you use, like, a different, like, a, like a, you know, feature, okay, like, uh, one feature, I mean, as soon as like, each feature is a, is a value, it's a separate value, independent feature, then pretty much, like, uh, you know, uh, <coughs> the negative one just means, like, uh, you know, you are going to do the, uh, um, um, uh, the average and uh, you know just just do the, the, the normalization okay for that particular uh, uh, feature okay but uh, uh, you know uh, in the future we are going to talk about like uh, you know the input batch may be two dimensional for example like uh, like a uh, batch size uh, this is like uh, the regular case that batch size feature Okay, base size feature. Okay, uh, then, then you are going to uh, normalize each feature separately. Okay, uh, but uh, later on, okay, when we talk about CNN, the input batch will be three-dimensional. Okay, so um, it's going to be something like batch size, height, width. Okay, if that's the case, then negative one means like uh, you are going to you know, do the normalization over the width dimension, okay? Because if, assuming that's, that we are using like uh, um, uh, the, um, the, the uh, fashion MNIST data set, I mean, which is a 2D, you know, uh, in, in our, in our pre, uh, uh, example, we, we flatten it into just like a 784 uh, independent, Features, okay. So it's going to be something more like a batch size feature, okay. So we we just use like a you know default 
you know, x is a uh, hyperparameter without any problem. But if we are going to treat each uh, fashion MIST, uh, you know, uh, picture, okay, small picture, okay, uh, as like a 2D input, then we are going to get like a, the batch, input batch will be 3D, which is batch size, height, width. And if you don't, if you use the D4 axis, okay, value, which is negative one, okay, the B layer will compute 28 mean, 28 standard deviation, one per column, okay, of pixels, computed across all instances in the batch and across all rows in the column, okay? So, because, you know, it's going to be, it's going to normalize, you know, over the last uh, 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 dimension, okay? So it's going to, you know, but, the, you know, if, if this is not what we want, okay? Um, I mean, because it's going to, we are going to just, ha going to have like 28 scale parameter, 28 shift parameters as well, okay? So if this is not what we, what we want, okay? We want to do like a normalization for each pixel, okay? Then we should specify axis hyperparameter to be one, two, because this is what the, 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 the you know, um, you know, the, um, uh, x, the, 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 the dimensions that we want to normalize, ba I mean, I mean, ba based upon. The one, two means like, uh, you know, the second and the third dimension, okay? Because the axis value start from zero. Zero means the first dimension, okay? So, so the, 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 the batch size is, uh, is uh, the zero dimension. And uh, height is dimension one, width is dimension two. So this one, two means, just means we want it, the, no, no, the, the normalization to be done you know, based on per height and the per width. If it's per height and per width, then it's for one pixel each time. Okay? Just want you to be aware, okay, we have such a control over like uh, how, uh, what, what uh, you know, uh, input data we want to normalize, okay? I mean, it's, it is uh, by uh, adjusting the axis hyperparameter, okay? So the batch normalization is able to do different jobs, uh, uh, you know, during training and after training. Okay, as I said, because during training it is going to, you know, compute the the mu and uh, um, standard deviation for each batch, right? And uh, also it's going to do that uh, that uh, exponential moving average estimation for the. The, the, the average and the standard deviation for the whole population. Remember? Okay, it's going to do all these things during training. But after training, okay, it is going to use the estimated, uh, the, the I mean, average and uh, standard deviation for the whole population, okay, to do the inference. Remember? Right? So, so, so how does it achieve that? Because sometimes, I mean, when we write a program, we also want to have control over like, uh, for example, like during training, we wanted to do something. I mean, uh, after training, okay, we wanted to do something else. So how do we, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, do that? It's like this, okay? You know, class batch normalization, okay, it's like, uh, you know, it subclass the layer, okay? And then, okay, we define the core. I mean, in the core, okay, we have like a training uh, uh, you know, um, uh, argument, okay, which is said to be none, okay. So, so the training, okay, is like uh, going to be, you know, uh, one, okay, during, during training, okay. Training is said to be one during tra training. And uh, it's going to be said to be zero, okay, after training, okay. So you, could, you, you can use this uh, argument okay, in the core uh, method to control like what to do, okay, you know, how to, I mean, to control like 
what you do, I mean, during the training, and what else to do, you know, after the training. Okay, so this is just to tell you, okay, I mean, how you can you can write a program, uh, write write something. I mean, I mean that allow like uh, Keras to 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 do something during training and do something else, you no, know, after training. Okay, this is, you know, just just include that this training. Uh, argument and you are able to use that to control um, you know your program hmm? so um, so now we are you know almost done with the uh, um, batch normalization but uh, the last thing batch normalization has become one of the most used layers in deep neural networks to the point that it is often omitted in a diagram. A lot of time, I mean, we'll draw like a model diagram, right? Like, oh, this layer is something. This layer is, I mean, is something else, blah, blah, blah. But the, the BN is used so often that you don't need to draw it like in, a, in, in your model diagram because we, we pretty much use it all the time, okay? So uh, this is especially the case in a CNN, okay, in a CNN, you pretty much don't see any model that do not use batch normalization. Of course, in uh, MLP, you could use batch normalization too, okay, but, uh, you know, uh, um, just want you guys to be aware, okay, batch normalization is a very important technique because not only it fight with the, you know, the, the, the uh, vanishing exploding gradient problem, it also act as a regularization technique. So, so it, it has the, all those benefits. It, even though it's a slightly small, uh, slower, but uh, you know, it allows you to train the model much faster actually, okay? So a recent paper, okay, by Zhang Hongyi, okay, uh, they say like, uh, okay, there's a, Fix update, okay, weight initialization technique. Uh, uh, they introduce this uh, technique and, and they say, oh, they can use it to train a very deep neural network up to 10,000 layers without, BN, without using batch normalization. And they are able to achieve that like, state of the art performance on complex image classification tasks, okay. But this is like uh, not yet being confirmed. Um, uh, what should I say? Like batch normalization has been proposed, and uh, a lot of people use it to achieve like a good performance. So everybody knows like batch normalization is good. But this one, okay, uh, fixed update technique, okay. Uh, um, well, it has been proposed, and uh, but uh, so far still not. It's not adopted by many researchers. Okay, so some research may, may find it like uh, not as good as, uh, as they claimed, okay. You know like uh, in, in many papers like, uh, you know, they just report like uh, the best performance, you know. Uh, you know, not, not the, the, the they, they, should I say they are not honest? Probably the word is too strong, okay, here. I probably should say they are trying to make their research result look good, okay? So, so, you know, so a lot of time, when you see a paper that, that, is, uh, that talks about like a I mean, very good result, always keep a suspicious mind, okay? This is uh, especially the case when the paper comes from somewhere, uh, you know, um, I will not specify where it is, but uh, you get an idea. Okay, yeah, because I mean, you know, I understand like, uh, you know, in some area, like uh, they have like a big pressure to publish like a paper in the top conference and top journals. But, uh, um, you know, the pressure is one thing, but uh, research uh, integrity is, uh, is, uh, is, is, is something else. Okay, I think like, um, yeah. But I'm not saying like, you know, a lot of researchers, I mean, from over the world are, are very good. Okay, I'm not saying like uh, you know, you know the 
I mean, uh, um, you know, the research from, you know, uh, the, the, I mean, those areas are, are, are always poor. That's not what I meant to say, okay? So anyway, so, uh, so we are done with uh, batch normalization concept, okay? And uh, the next idea is called gradient clipping, okay? Um, the idea uh, is pretty much like this, okay? Yeah, I mean, uh, remember like, we have the uh, exploding gradient problem, right? If the gradient is too big, we also have an issue, right? Okay, um, uh, so this is especially the case in the recurrent neural networks. As I said, like a exploding gradient problem occur mostly in recurrent neural network, okay? So when you have, the, the, the gradient is too big, you just, you can just like, uh, you know, just cut it, just clip it, okay? Gradient clip, clip it, just clip, just, uh, you know, I mean, you use scissors to clip it, okay? Just, just, just reduce the value, okay? That's a very simple idea, okay? So, um, the gradient clipping, there are two ways to, to clip the gradient, okay? Why is called clip by value? Why is called clip by norm? Okay, so let, let's talk about clip by value first. Okay, implementing gradient clipping is uh, is very simple. Okay, so optimizer equal to keras dot optimizer dot sgd. But here, okay, in in inside here, you just say clip value equal to one point zero. So when I when you use specify clip value equal to one point zero here, okay, and then you use this optimizer. Okay, then that's uh, gradient creeping and the creep by value, okay? In, if you do this, then whichever has a, I mean, which dim whatever dimension has a gradient higher than 1.0, it will be replaced by 1.0, basically. So any value greater than, actually it's not, it works, works both way, okay? So, so not only greater than 1.0, it will be replaced by 1.0. If a value, if a, if a gradient is smaller than negative 1.0, it will be replaced by negative 1.02. Okay, so it, it, it's, this just means like uh, the absolute value of your gradient for every dimension is bounded by one. The, the absolute value of your gradient for every dimension is bounded by one. That, that's, that's what it means. Of course, you could use a different gradient value here, okay? So, so this idea is called clip by value, okay? And uh, this clip by value has some issues, okay? Has also has some issues, okay? What, what issue it may, it, may, I mean, it may have, okay? Uh, remember like uh, in the gradient descent, Okay, the direction of the gradient is important because it indicates where we should move to, right? Where we should move to to find like a lower, that I mean lower place of the the cost function, right? Okay, but say like uh, okay, uh, if if your gradient vector is 0 0.9, 100. If this is the case. It tells you that uh, the gradient is very close to north, right? Very close to north because the, the x uh, direction is only 0 0.9, but uh, the y is 100. So, so, so if you draw this vector, you will find that it's, it points to very close to north, right? Right? Okay, but if you use like a clip by value, okay, and uh, assuming you use the value, use exactly like uh, what we have here, what happens is that this vector will become 0 0.9, 1, right? Because that 100 will be replaced by 1, right? And 0 0.9, 1 is going to be close to 45 degree, right? North, northeast, right? Northeast close to northeast, like uh, exactly northeast, like a uh, 45 degree, right? Because you get the same, close, 
close value for x and the y value, right? So y is uh, north, y is uh, close to 45 degree. The, the difference is quite large, right? The direction, difference of the direction is quite large. So when you go, you know, use this direction to do gradient descent, you, you, you may instead get like a higher, I mean, increase the cost function, right? You, you may not reduce the cost function, but to increase it. Okay, so this is the issue. Okay, this is the issue for creep by value. Okay, so, so you know, that's why we have another idea called creep by norm. Okay, so basically creep by norm is to make sure, okay, uh, if you have some, say if it's like a x, x, uh, uh, two-dimensional, so x1, x2, right? So it's like, uh, this is your gradient, x1, x2. Then you need to guarantee x1 square plus x2 square. This one has to be small or equal to a fixed value. Okay, has to be small or equal to a fixed value. Okay, instead of like a, we asking like a, no, every single dimension, their value is, is, is bounded. We want the, the you, can, you can consider this as a length, the norm or length of this vector to be bounded. Okay, so if it's greater, if it's too big, like this case, 0 0.9, 100, then you compute this, and then you divide original x1, x2 by this value. Okay, so this is what happened. So, so you can see, if you use creep norm, okay, you're, you, you set a boundary, uh, bound, upper bound for your, your, your L2 norm, okay? So you can set the creep norm to be 1.0, and uh, the vector 0 0.9, 100, will be crept to 0 0.00899964 and 0 0.9999595, okay, because they are, going to be, they, these two values are divided by the, the length of the vector, the length of the vector, okay? So, so we got the, the, the square sum of this is going to be one, okay? And uh, if you use creep by norm, you can see that the direction of this uh, vector is still going to be the same because you are dividing these two dimensions by the same value anyway. Okay, so the direction is maintained. Okay, preserving its orientation. Okay, but almost eliminating the first component. Okay, as a result. Okay. So which one to use? Let me put it this way. Okay, if you're problem is easy, creep by value is normally good enough, okay? But for co more complex problem, creep by norm is normally better than creep by value. But uh, again, creep by norm uh, take more time to compute, okay? Because for each, com for each vector, it needs to compute this thing. And uh, L2 norm take time to compute, right? Okay, it's not just by like uh, comparing each component by like uh, a simple value. Okay, you need to compute this uh, you know, square, uh, I mean the, the sum of the square and then and see like uh, if it is over the limit or if it's, if it's over the limit you need to do the division. So, so that, that takes time. Okay, it takes more time. Okay, because there are, there are, there are you know, more computations involved. Okay, so you, the gradient explode, explode during training. Okay, if you see that, observe that. Okay, you can track the size of the gradient using tensor board. Remember, I talked about tensor board. The tensor board uh, is a good visualization tool which allows you to even track like uh, the gradient during training. Okay, so uh, during training, if your gradient become larger and larger, or like it becomes like a very unstable, 
that you may have gradient exploding problem. Okay, so you may want to try both creeping by value and the creeping by norm. Okay, with different thresholds, and see which option perform better. Okay, on the validation set. Okay. And then it's uh, the transfer learning, okay. Uh, so we are done with like uh, uh, batch normalization and the uh, gradient cre uh, creeping. Then, okay, it's uh, the transfer learning. I, I'm not sure if I can finish this part today, but uh, anyway, it's a really good idea to train a very large, uh, uh, not a good idea to train a very large uh, deep uh, neural network from scratch. As I, I actually already told you previously that, okay, for a deep neural network, we nowadays we, we almost always use uh, transfer learning, okay? So, so you should always try to find an existing neural network that accomplishes a similar task to the one you are trying to tackle. And when we say similar task, it is actually not, you know, it, it, it is, much more flexible than you may you may consider, okay, as we will talk about later, okay. Um, then just reuse the lower layers of the network. So we call this transfer learning. So you will not only speed up the training considerably, but it will also require much less training da data. So this is like uh, important. Remember like uh, uh, at the beginning of this chapter, we talked about several issues with uh, deep learning. One of the issues is like, uh, um, a lot of time, I mean, we don't have a lot of training data, right? Or like a train, even if you have a large training data set, I mean, it, you don't have money you, uh, to, to label all of them, right? So the, the size of the training data, if it's like limited, then, you know, uh, transfer learning also help with that, okay? So suppose you have access to a DNN that was trained to classify pictures with 100 different categories including animals, plants, uh, plants, vehicles, and everyday objects. So now I want to train a DNN to classify specific types of vehicles. These tests are very similar, okay, because, well, uh, the first uh, model already learned how to classify different types, which include vehicles, so it knows like, uh, you know, uh, some, you know, what is vehicle, what is not. But now you want to classify different vehicles. So these tags are very similar, okay. You can get some, you can use uh, transfer learning, okay. So even partly overlapping. So you should try to reuse part of the first network. I think I used this uh, as an example previously, right? So this is uh, the higher level, you know, Oh, Mila. Thank So this is this picture show you the transfer learning basically. Okay, as I said, we want to you know reuse the lower part of a model that is already trained. Okay, we call this existing DM for task A, and we want to create a new DM for task for similar task, which is called task B. So you can see we copy the lower layers for the higher layers. We, we, we will replace, we normally cannot use the same output layer, okay? It's, it's impossible to use the same output layer. And we may want to replace the top few hidden layers. As for how many hidden layers we want to replace, okay? It really depends on the, the size of the labeled data set that you, you, you have at hand for this uh, new task, okay? The smaller size of the training data you have for this new task, the, the, you know, the, 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 the fewer layers you would like to create. But here, okay, this just uh, showed the uh, illustration. So here we, we have this new 
we will introduce two new hidden layers, and we have a new output layer. Okay, so this tell you, and we have a lock here. Okay, this lock just means we want to fix the weight of the lower layer when you train this new model. Because the lower layers that you copy from the previous model already know, already uh, uh, has, uh, it are already able to to deal with like a lower level, uh, the lower abstraction uh, concept, okay, already. So you would like to preserve their ability, okay, as much as possible. So that's why we, we normally will fix the weight of these lower layers, especially during like initial training of this model, okay, and this new layers, of course, because they are new layers, we normally, I mean, we will set them to be trainable and uh, uh, to tune their uh, parameters uh, based on, you know, I mean, this fixed weights, okay? So um, just remember this uh, concept. So from this concept, one more thing you can tell is that, okay, because you are going to reuse the input layer, right? So uh, say, uh, even if your um, your tasks are similar, okay, if your if this input has different dimension than this input, say this input like uh, the the it's uh, twenty eight by twenty eight, okay, but this input is thirty by thirty. Then what you need to do is that because the input layer stays the same, right? So when you add another layer to, to, to basically like a, either you need to add one more layer to, to stretch the, the, I mean the, the input to be 28 by 28. Or you can do certain uh, uh, data preprocessing to convert the input to be 28 by 28. Okay, because the input layer has to be stay the same, okay, using the same dimension, okay. So if the input picture of your new task don't have the same size, okay, I already talked about this, okay. So transfer learning will work well only if the input have the similar low level features, okay. And the output layer of the original model should usually be replaced because it is most likely not useful, okay. And it all may not even have the right number of outputs for new tasks, okay, uh, as I already told you, okay. So similarly, the upper hidden layers of the original model are less likely to be as useful as the lower layers because the lower layers deal with like a, uh, more abstract, the more simple uh, features. And those simple features can usually can be carried over to the new model much better. But the higher, la higher hidden layer deal with the more abstraction, more complex abstraction, which usually are more associated with uh, the problem they are uh, uh, problem of the original uh, 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 model, okay, uh, which may not, as I say, like because the, the new text is has a different problem. So the the, the, the higher layer, uh, uh, I mean, layers may may not be as useful as the lower layer, okay. So the more similar text, uh, uh, the text are, the more layers you want to reuse. So this is like a obviously, I mean, a easy consequence, okay? So for more, for very similar tasks, try keeping all the hidden layers and just replace the output layer, okay? That's, I mean, uh, that if the tasks are very, very similar, okay? And uh, um, the process, okay? Mm -hmm. Here, okay. You want to freeze all the reuse layer, okay. Freeze is a term we used, okay, that uh, sometimes we want to keep the the weights of the, the I mean we want to we want the, the I mean the weights of the uh, certain layers to be fixed, okay, during training. Then we, we, we have we, we say we want to freeze that layer, okay. Okay, just want to 
this is a ter new term that you, you may want to uh, 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 familiar with, okay? So make their weights non-trainable, okay? So that gradient descent won't m modify them, okay? Then train your model and see how it performs. Then try unfreezing one or two of the top hidden layers to that bad propagation, tweak them, okay? And see if performance improves, okay? So the more the heat training data you have, the more layers you can unfreeze. This really depends on the size of the data, uh, size of training data you have, okay? It is also useful to reduce the learning rate when you unfreeze reused layers, okay? Because, I mean, you, you, you want to avoid, okay, changing too much weight of the, the layers that you copy from the previous model, okay? So you want to use a, a smaller learning rate just to, to, to maintain the, the weight of the, I mean, you copy uh, as much as possible, okay? So if you still cannot get good performance and uh, you have little training data, you can drop the top hidden layer and the freezing all the remaining hidden layers again. So you can do this repeatedly until you find the right number of layers to reuse, okay? If you have plenty of training data, you may try replacing the top hidden layers Okay, you can replace you know, more than one layer together, okay, instead of dropping them, and even adding more hidden layers, okay. So, uh, I mean, here we have an example, but uh, okay, we only have 10 minutes, okay. Suppose the fashion MNIST data set only contain A classes. For example, all the classes except for sandal and the shirt, okay except stand on the shirt, okay? One is uh, shoes, one is uh, clothes, right? Someone build a tr and train a Keras model on less set and got reasonably good performance, greater than 90% accu accuracy. So we call this model A. So now uh, we, you want to tackle a different task. You have uh, images of sandals and the shirt and you want to train a binary classifier, okay, positive uh, to be uh, shirt, negative to be sandal, okay. So your data set is quite small, so you only have 200 labeled image, okay. When you train a new model for this task, only 200 ima uh, ima labeled image, okay, uh, with the same architecture as model A, it performs 97.2% accuracy. So it's pretty good, right? But uh, uh, because it's a much easier task, it's a binary classification only, right? Okay. But uh, now, okay, while drinking your morning coffee, you realize that the, your task is quite similar to the task A. So perhaps transfer learning can help. So when you say, uh, why do you say it's similar? Remember the task A is able to classify A classes without including sandal and the shirt, okay? But now you want to classify sandal and the shirt. So they are, they are, they are different, right? But uh, still, okay, we consider they have similar task because see, we have high heels, remember? We have high heel class in the original uh, A, cl A classes, I mean, we have Sendo, we have um, high heels. I remember we also have shoes, okay? So we have multiple classes for footwear, okay? And we have obviously multiple classes for clothes. We have sleeves, long sleeves. We have like dresses, okay? I mean, which are similar to shirts, right? And the other footwear are similar to uh, 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 um, sandal, although they are, no, they, they are not sandals. I mean, uh, the, the, the clothes are not shirts, but they are similar, right? So, so you can see from this example that, okay, when I say similar tasks, they do not need to overlap as long as their concept are similar, okay? you could use transfer learning already, okay? So this is the example I want to emphasize, that 
you know, a lot of you, I mean, when it comes to transfer learning, you feel like, oh, it's, it has to be, you know, similar, con similar problem. But the problem can be, you know, a lot different than you may think. Okay. So anyway, okay. So here. Um, so first, we want to load model A, create a new model based on that mo uh, model's layer, right? So first, okay, we load model, okay, we call that my, my model A dot H5. So we load it into model A. So here, okay, we use chaos dot models dot sequential, okay, we use a sequential API, okay, and then we basically, uh, you know, use the, the model A layers, every layer except the last one, okay, this means every layer except the last one, which is, the last one is the output layer, okay. And we want we assign this one to be model B on A, okay, and then okay, uh, we add because uh, the the new task is a binary classification, right? So we need to add a new output layer with one uh, neuron uh, and with the sigmoid activation. Basically, outputs like uh, the probability of a positive class for the input, right? Okay, so this is the one way to do it. But keep in mind, okay, if you do it this way, whenever you train your model B on A, okay, because whenever you train your model B on A, at the same time, you will modify model A because they actually, if when you do this, it act, I mean, model B on A and model A, they actually share the lower layers. They share the lower layers. Okay, this is not simple copy. They share the low layer. So when you train model B on A, the model A will also mo be modified. So if you want to clone the model, you want to not to change model A, okay, not to affect model A when you train the new model, then, you know, you need to clone model A before you reuse its layer. So this is how you do it, okay. We call, we, we use keras that models, chrome model, model A, and we call that model A chrome. And then, okay, uh, model A chrome set weight, okay, uh, model A get weight. Okay, we want to get the weight from model A to this uh, chrome model. Okay, when you do it this way, then the chrome model will not, if you do anything on the Chrome model, the Chrome model will not affect the original model A. Okay, so it depends on if the model A is important to you or not. If it's important, then, you know, you, you don't want to mess, me, 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 mess, it, me, mess around with it, with that. But uh, if, if that's not an issue, because you already saved the model, saved your model A in a file anyway. So that's probably okay, okay. So then, okay, you could train model B on A for task B, okay, but since the new output layer was initialized randomly, it will make large errors, okay, so there will be large error gradients, okay, this large error gradient will change uh, the, the reused weight significantly. So to avoid that, we want to freeze the reused layers, okay, so how do we re freeze the layers. Here is the way, okay. For layers in model B on A dot layers, okay, except the final output layer, okay, except the last layer, we want to set layer dot trainable to be false. So this basically, you know, ensure uh, every layer uh, is freezed except the output layer, okay. And then you need to compile model B dot uh, on A compile loss is binary cross entropy, optimize the SGD, matrix is accuracy. So you, you must always compile your model after you freeze or unfreeze layers, okay? If you change some layers to be trainable or uh, if you set some layers to be non-trainable, you should always recompile your model. Otherwise, I mean, it doesn't work, okay? And then, okay, you can try to train your model, okay, based on your, you know, little available new 
uh, training data set. Okay, so here, okay, see history equal to model B on A feet. So we uh, we use uh, uh, you know X train B X train uh, Y train B epoch. We only use four epochs. Okay, you so in the in the first few epochs, okay, uh, validation data blah, blah, blah. Here you 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 want to train the first few epochs, okay, with with the the copied layers frozen, okay, and then okay you see, and normally at this stage in this stage, you will set the learning rate to be a little bit large. Okay, but here I don't think they, 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 they change the learning rate. Okay, but now, okay, you unfreeze, unfreeze the, the other layers, right? For a layer, blah, blah, blah. Layer that trainable equal to true. So now, okay, you unfreeze all those uh, 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 previous layers. And then remember, uh, every, and then you set, you know, optimizer, chaos optimizer, STD, but now you use a much smaller learning rate because original learning rate is 10 to a negative 2 but now it's, uh, you said it to be 10 to a negative 4 so it's uh, 100 times smaller right and uh, um, you know remember every time you, you, you change some layers to be trainable or non-trainable you need to recompile model so model B on A compile okay you, you compile it again loss equal to binary cross entropy optimizer optimizer and you use uh, metric accuracy, and then you call the feed again. Now you you have 16 epochs, but uh, because you use a much smaller learning rate, it allows you to avoid changing the layers you copy from model A too much. Okay, remember because we are using transfer learning, so we want the the the, the layers that you copy. I mean, their weights, okay, stay as close to the original model weight as possible, okay? So that's why we set this uh, learning rate to be much smaller, okay? So at the end, this model test accuracy is 99.25. So which means that transfer learning reduces the error rate from 2.8% to 0.7%. That's factor of four, so which is very nice, okay? But uh, really, like, uh, this is, uh, you know, the author of the textbook, uh, uh, you know, admit that he he's cheating, okay, he's cheating, okay? Uh, because he tried many configurations until that w the one that demonstrates a strong improvement, okay? If you try to change the classes or, or the random seed, okay, you will see that the improvement gener generally drops or even vanish or reverses, okay? So this is called torturing the data until it confesses. So basically, it's, this is like a, a forged, as I say, it's kind of like a forged result, okay? So when you do research, you should always avoid doing that, okay? When a paper just look too positive, you should be suspicious, as I said, okay? Perhaps the flashy new technique does not actually help much, okay? As I already uh, mentioned, okay? So, um, you know, it may even be, uh, even degrade the performance. But the author just try to, you know, many variants and report the, the, the only the best results, okay? So this is uh, especially like uh, uh, often like in the recent era, okay, when there are simply too many people trying to publish like uh, first tier conference papers. Okay, so a lot of paper, their results are not trustworthy. Okay, so anyway, um, well, so why did I cheat? Okay, it turns out that transfer learning does not work very well with small dense network because the network is too small. Okay, the network is too small. The transfer learning works well for large network, for large network, and especially well for CNN. Okay, so um, you know, for it, it works best with deep convolutional neural networks. Okay, um, but uh, 
you know, the example that we use, okay, is a, it's a fashion MIST that the, the, the model is really too small to demonstrate the transfer learning. But uh, because we haven't talked about CN yet, so we can only use that example. Okay, but um, you know, later on when we talk about CN, we will talk about this transfer learning again, okay, with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with accurate, you know, and at that time, I mean, also, I mean, of the textbook, the promise is not going to be, uh, the result is going to be, you know, more authentic, okay. Uh, so I think I mean, yeah I mean we we are probably you know out of time. So let's you now stop here. Okay, I I hope like uh, next time we are able to finish this uh, chapter. Okay, I hope. Okay, uh, then we the next next time we are going to talk about CNN. Okay, any question? And. Uh, just want to remind you, okay, it's about time for you to search for your, you know, collaborated uh, uh, team, okay, be for the final project, because the final project is going to be done by, you know, two, two small groups, okay, so, so make sure you find your, you know, friends as soon as possible, okay, thank you. Um, before we continue our lecture, okay, I, I think like uh, the TA told me that uh, because some students uh, drop this class, so the group member may change, okay, uh, due to um, I mean some I mean those uh, you know um, student dropping the class, so. Um, so the TA actually uh, suggests that the deadline for the uh, project two uh, ex uh, to be extended for one more week. Okay, so uh, so I told the TA, TA to be okay. So just want you guys to be aware. Okay, the deadline for the project two is extended for one more week. Okay, but. Um, um, if your teammate, okay, happen to drop the course, okay, and you need assistance, okay, please, you know, uh, contact TA, okay, and I will have the, uh, the TA will help you to connect to other uh, students, okay, for that. So, Last time we talked about uh, uh, different techniques to um, help training a neural network such as batch normalization as well as transfer learning, right? And uh, um, we know transfer learning help us to uh, train the neural network when you do not have a lot of labeled data, okay? Um, there's a, another uh, technique called unsupervised pre-training, okay, uh, that you could use in case you do, if you do not have a lot of labeled data, okay. So basically, okay, of course you should try to gather as much labeled data as possible, okay. But if you cannot do that, okay, um, you know, one way to help you to train the model is this unsupervised pre-training. Okay, what is unsupervised pre-training? Okay, uh, it's something like this. Okay, 
So, um, because you do not have uh, a lot of uh, labeled data, so what you what you do is basically okay. Every step you try to you know only train one layer. Okay, so for example, in the first step, okay, you train one hidden you train one hidden layer. Okay, and after you finish training, okay, when you move on to the second step, okay, you will you know. Uh, freeze the layer that you just trained and uh, add another hidden layer on top of that and uh, you again use the limited amount of training data okay the label training data to train only the new hidden layer the uh, hidden two here so you keep doing that okay to build up a deep neural network that can help you to to tackle like a more complicated problem, okay. So this is uh, you know so so I mean at each you know at next each step basically you you will freeze the layers you obtained from the previous uh, uh, you know process, and you only train one new hidden layer because you do not have a lot of labeled data, okay. So this concept is called unsupervised training, uh, pre-training. I'm sorry, unsupervised pre-training. Okay. So eventually, when you have enough layers, of course, uh, you are going to use a you know smaller learning rate and maybe unlock a couple of layers to fine-tune your model. Okay. So this is like a you know. Uh, you are about to finish the training. Okay, you do that. Okay. So um, this technique is actually quite famous. Okay, because like uh, um, you know um, the Jeffrey Hinton actually uh, um, I mean used this technique in twenty uh, in two thousand six. Okay, to train a deep neural network. Which actually uh, uh, mark the revival of neural network. Okay, uh, um, so of course at that time, okay, this unsupervised pre-training, okay, was used. I mean, the, the model they use is the called restricted Boltzmann machine. Okay, this is a special uh, neural network. Okay. Uh, we are not going to talk about this uh, restricted Boltzmann machine. Okay, uh, if you are interested, you can you can check out Appendix E for the detail of this model. Okay, uh, the reason we don't talk about this is because okay, this model is pretty much obsolete. Okay, um, nowadays nobody uses restricted Boltzmann machine. If you see a paper that uses restricted Boltzmann machine. Most likely, that paper is is over ten years old. Okay, um, the reason we don't use this uh, RBN is because okay, this RBN when you train this RBN model, okay, for every iteration, you need to wait for this model to be what we call stabilized. Okay, so it takes a long, long time to train this model. Okay. So, so this is like uh, uh, you know um, why this model is I mean nobody use it anymore be, because it's just too difficult to train it. Okay. However, okay, back to 2006. Of course, there was uh, you know 25 more than 20, uh, I mean 15 years ago. Okay. So at that time, okay, RBM was still used. So. The uh, Jeffrey Hinton used this, okay, uh, along with the um, unsupervised pre-training, to to you know to get the job done, okay. But uh, uh, nowadays, okay, for this unsupervised pre-training, we can still do unsupervised pre-training, but we probably do not use RBN anymore, okay. What we are, can use is uh, uh, auto encoder or again. Okay, this type of uh, special generative model. Okay, um, 
So if you use autoencoder, okay, actually you can start from you know either here or here directory, okay. Um, it is much more powerful, okay, and um, um, but uh, of course, I mean, uh, in this chapter we still do not um, we, we we will not talk about. Uh, autoencoder or again, of course, I mean, we won't talk about it until we finish the CN and RNN, so um, it, it will be covered hopefully toward the end of this uh, class, okay? And uh, when I start talking about the uh, autoencoder, I will come back to revisit this uh, unsupervised pre-training, okay? So anyway, Um, so this is the, the unsupervised pre-training is the second technique you could use okay when you do not have a lot of labeled data there is a third technique you could use okay in case you do not have a lot of labeled data which is called you know auxiliary task okay pre-training on auxiliary task, okay? What is this, okay? It's kind of interesting, okay? Actually, this concept is probably, I mean, because it does not require, like, a uh, requirement to cover uh, uh, any new material to, to talk about the concept uh, about this. So, so hopefully, like, uh, you know, uh, you can grasp the concept real quick, okay? Basically, it's like this. Well, you don't have uh, the label, the data to train your, your task. Let's call this task, task A, okay? But you could easily, if you could easily find a lot of data that you could use to train for another task, we call that task B, and it happens that task A and the task B are sort of correlated, okay? So what you do is, you can, tr you can train a model for task B first, using a lot of uh, uh, data you gathered, okay? And then, okay, once you have the model for task B, okay, remember, like, we can do the transfer learning, right? Okay, you can use the previous, uh, the, the, like, uh, like uh, the first few layers from the, uh, the model in the task B, uh, to, to, to construct the model for task A, okay, and uh, apply the transfer learning basically, okay. So, so this is like, a, you know, uh, an interesting approach, okay, an interesting approach. So you, you may wonder, okay, um, is it very easy to find a task that uh, first it has to be somehow related to task A, second, you, you have to have a lot of data, okay, for this task B that is easily obtained, okay. Um, let, let, me, let me give you uh, uh, an example, okay, for here, okay. For example, if you want to build a system, okay, to recognize faces, okay, for example, like uh, the surveillance system, okay, uh, for many companies, uh, they now use, like, uh, you know, you can just, uh, they just, like, uh, have a camera in the front door and, uh, use the, you can, if you are, you, you, are, you are the company employee, basically they, they just use the camera to capture your face, to recognize if, to, 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 to distinguish, okay, those people who are not the company employee, right? I mean, this is like, a, you know, kind of like, a, a, I mean, a, a one, one, this is like a one big application of like a face recognition, actually, okay? So, but the, the issue for this, to build this system is that, okay, obviously you need a model that recognize the company employees, right? But, um, okay, if you, are, if you are in a company, okay, if the company tell you, okay, we, we need to, you know, build a face recognition system, and uh, the company asks you to submit your photos, how many photos can you submit to your company? 
Okay, maybe 10, 20, that's a lot already, right? Okay, I mean, it's impossible for a company to ask the employee, each employee to submit like hundreds of photos. That's just, that's just outrageous, right? It's just not possible, right? I mean, if company can only gather like uh, maybe, a, you know, a couple of photos from each employee, how can the company build a face recognition system? Okay, to recognize company employee. Right? So that's the issue, right? This is obviously the, the issue about lacking, uh, uh, you know, labeled data set, right? We don't have a lot of labeled data set, okay? Uh, when the company decide to build a face recognition system. But, but we do know that, okay, um, a lot of people have like an Instagram account, right? And on those uh, Instagram account, okay, people post their, put their photos there like a lot, right? Okay, although we know those photos are not, may not be uh, the company employee, but that's fine, okay? We can, we can train a model, okay, um, that maybe, you know, be able to identify, let's say, okay, if two photos, okay, represent the same person based on their face, based on their face, the face in the photo, basically. I mean, you can easily get a lot of such data set from the Instagram, why? Because as long as these two photos come from the same Instagram account, most likely the person in the photos are the same person, right? Right, will be the same person. So, so you can you can get a lot of uh, such data set to train a model to to uh, to to basically you know uh, um, tell you okay if this the person in these two photos represent the same person or not. Okay, so now okay, suppose you have this model. Okay, you can easily transform this model to, you know, to become like, a, you know, um, the surveillance system, like face recognition system for the company. Basically just, uh, you know, gather your company employee photo and use that, okay, and, uh, and uh, you, 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 you get another photo from camera, okay, the incoming visitor. You just compare this one with like, uh, you know, the employee's photo and see if they match or not, right? So this is like uh, one way, uh, one, one of the uh, you know, pre-training on an auxiliary task. Very, that's very easy to, I mean, to, to be applied to solve this uh, you know, uh, face recognition uh, system issue, okay, that the company wants to build, okay. So, uh, another example, another example which is actually, you know, very, very important, um, you know, uh, it actually, uh, the NLP, uh, like especially in recent uh, uh, years, the NLP, uh, 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 you know, research gets a big boost from this, uh, the, 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 the pre-training pre on auxiliary task concept. Actually, um, we know like uh, NLP, you know, in order to train a model that recognizes some language features, it's difficult, right? It's difficult. But, um, you know, we could, okay, we could do something like this, okay? For example, okay, we can get a lot of uh, text from the World Wide Web, for example, Wikipedia. Okay, Wikipedia has a lot of uh, uh, sentences, right? You can use a crawler to easily download those uh, sentences, okay? And uh, then, okay, you can just, uh, you know, 
randomly remove remove some words from the sentence. For example, like uh, you know, this sentence, why are you saying? You can randomly remove this uh, word, okay, here. So this word can be either R or word, right? So you can use this way to train, because you have vast amount of data, right? Because you download the whole Wikipedia page, okay? So there are, you know, millions of sentences, okay, that you have. And uh, because you can, uh, because this, this word removing is done by you, right? It's done by you. So you know the ground truth, right? You know the ground truth. So, so you can use this data set, okay, to train a model, okay? This model, obviously, the task is to fill the missing words, right? But because, okay, if this model performs well, then you can imagine this model should have a very good understanding of this language, right? Otherwise, it wouldn't be able to fill out the, the, those missing words, right? Okay, then you can utilize that model, okay, even though it's, um, it's used for just like uh, filling the missing word, but you can use that mo uh, model, okay, for other NLP tasks. Because the other, any NLP task, okay, the model is required to have a good understanding of the language, right? So basically, okay, um, this concept, this concept, okay, uh, actually, you know, uh, help the, the, the progress of NLP research a lot, okay? Nowadays, nobody, if, if, you are, you, if, I, if you are doing any, any NLP research, nobody train a model from scratch. There are so many pre-trained model, okay, out there for any NLP task. For example, okay, the most well-known model is called BERT, B-E-R-T. Okay, there are also other models such as, uh, uh, because they are like a variation of BERT, so they, call, they are called like a Robert, Albert, you know, you know, pretty much any word with bird in, in, in there, okay? So, just want you to be aware, okay? This uh, pre-training on auxiliary task is very important, okay? And uh, so, for this example, do you consider, consider this as uh, uh, supervised or unsupervised learning? Remember, like, uh, okay, um, in machine learning, in machine learning, okay, supervised learning means we learn from labeled data set, right? Basically, you know the ground truth and you train the model, okay, to, 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 to match with the ground truth as much as, much as possible. That's uh, the basic idea of supervised learning. For unsupervised learning, on the other hand, you have the data, you have the data but you do not need to provide label. You just have the model to learn from the data without the label. That's called unsupervised learning. Okay, in general, unsupervised learning is more difficult than supervised learning, by the way, because obviously, you don't, if you don't have ground truth, it's more difficult to learn anything from the data. Okay, however, how about the one that I just mentioned? Okay, when you download these millions of sentences and you you know, you, 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 you actually like, uh, like uh, remove some words from these sentences intentionally, okay, to create a training data. We call this thing as self-supervised learning. Self-supervised learning because we know, uh, we, we, we sort of create the label data by ourselves, okay. This ground truth is not, you know, really by uh, done by by manual labeling, it is it is done by by a by a program that you know randomly remove the words from the sentences, right? So so this is uh, uh, the, the 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 data label data are automatically generated, okay? So 
you know, we call this, this, you know, in this type of re, uh, uh, learning as self-supervised learning. And because, okay, for this self-supervised learning, you don't need to have um, the, the uh, to, to pay, to, to pay like a much labor work for, uh, to label the data, okay? So um, we consider this self-supervised learning as one type of unsupervised learning. Okay, just want you to be aware, okay? Um, the type of learning, okay, this thing present. But I'm not saying, okay, I'm not saying uh, uh, pre-training uh, on auxiliary task has to be, you know, the, the, the task be has to be self unsupervised learning, uh, self supervised learning. It doesn't not it does not have necessarily have to be, okay. As long as you have, you can sort of find another task which is related to to the task you want to resolve, and it's much easier for you to gather a lot of data for that task. Then we call that you know, pre-training on auxiliary task, okay? Um, as for that, the, 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 that task B is, uh, super, is self supervised learning or not? I mean, well, if it's self supervised learning, of course it's easier, but if it's not, okay, uh, if, if you are able to, you know, label the data with a lot uh, lower cost, with a much lower cost, well, you can do that too, right? So, so we have, um, you know, if you have, if you do not have a lot of label the data, okay, we talk about three different ways that help you to, to, to you know, to deal with the problem. The first one is, uh, you know, transfer learning. The second one is uh, pre-training on auxiliary task. The, second one, the third one is, uh, you know, the, this uh, unsupervised uh, pre-training. Okay, unsupervised pre-training. So how about the speeding up the training? Okay, speeding up the training process, okay? Uh, because training a large neural network, okay, it can be very slow, okay? So, you know, uh, previously we already talked about a couple of ways, you know, to, to increase the training speed. For example, okay, uh, we can apply a better initialization strategy, okay? Such as, uh, the Chong, He initialization, Xavier initialization, remember? And uh, we can use, uh, you know, better uh, activation function, such as variant of Liru, as well as ELU, or, um, you know, Siru, okay? Um, those activation functions, you know, also help uh, you to train the model faster, okay? Another approach is use uh, batch normalization. Okay, that's obviously like, uh, remember I told you using the batch normalization, speed up the training by, you know, some studies say it speed up training by 17 times, right? Okay, and uh, uh, transfer learning obviously, you know, this, uh, okay, use, reusing part of the pre-train network, okay, transfer learning. Obviously, all, not only reduce the amount, the required amount of labeled data set, it also help you to get your model trained faster, obviously, okay? But, but, are there other techniques that we could use, okay, to speed up the training? Okay, one thing we could use is, uh, you know, uh, the optimizer, okay, optimizer, the fast optimizer. So far, we only use one optimizer, right? The stochastic gradient, uh, uh, no, gradient uh, SGD, right? Stochastic gradient descent, okay? And, uh, you know, that, that, you know, the, 
there are a lot of optimizers uh, which are much faster than the regular gradient descent optimizer. Okay, so in here, okay, we are going to talk about you know a lot of optimizers. Okay, today. Okay, so it is one of the important topics today, actually. Okay, um, such as uh, momentum, Nesterov. Okay. Uh, NAG basically, okay, Ada grade, RMS prop, and Adam, uh, Adam Max, and uh, Naden, okay, they are all like uh, more advanced optimizers that can help you uh, train your model faster, basically, okay. So, the first one is momentum. Okay, so what is momentum uh, uh, optimizer? Okay, um, remember like uh, the rolling ball, rolling rolling uh, 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 ball in a uh, on, on uh, like a uh, you know on the surface example when I talk about like a uh, gradient descent. Remember that, right? Okay, so so basically gradient descent pretty much represent like uh, you know you know you are you try to find like a uh, like uh, try to advance to uh, the lower position, okay, in the cost function, right? Okay, so think about this, okay. Uh, if you have an uneven surface, okay, and you put a ball on the ground, okay, and the, the ball is going to roll toward the, the, the lower location, right? And actually it's going to if if if, uh, uh, if you have um, you know um, slope that leads to the lower position, you will see that ball actually roll faster and faster, right? The ball actually will gain the momentum, right? So so what exactly uh, is that? Basically, okay, the the ball will have acceleration acceleration right you you learn from physics okay you learn from physics that there's a acceleration okay that will help the ball roll faster and faster right okay but of course suppose um, no, I mean so this is uh, you know if, if you have the, 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 this if this slope is very long, okay, you will see this ball, you know, the speed keep increasing, but the, to a point that it will stabilize, right? The ball will not roll faster and faster and forever and to a light speed. That it's impossible, right? Why? Why is that? Why is that? I hope you still remember something from your physics class. Even though we know, like uh, in our in, in our department, actually we, we 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 cut down the physics class. I mean, you know, for the undergraduate uh, students, we, the, the 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 student in computer science, you uh, know, in our department now only need to take one, you know, three three credit hour physics, you know, which is um, you know, it's different from the other, like. Uh, uh, departments. I mean, in 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 the uh, in the College of Engineering, for example. Okay, they need to take like six credit hours, physics class. Okay, I mean, so I hope you still remember. You know, the ball keep rolling. You know, faster and faster until it stabilizes. Why does it sta stabilize? Friction. friction, right? Friction, because there is a friction that will cancel out the 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 you know. The acceleration, which make the the ball, you know, is eventually, you know, you know the the forces will cancel out each other, and uh, the ball will enter a state that you know it you 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 you're moving at the, the the constant speed. Eventually, eventually, but at least at the beginning, you see the ball keep moving faster and faster, right? Okay, that's the basic physics uh, that you should uh, you should learn from. Or you should see from the experiment, basically. Okay, so this is really this momentum optimization. It has been proposed by this Boris Poryak, okay, 
when was that? 1964. This thing was proposed not for deep learning. It was proposed long, long time ago, okay? Uh, because remember, uh, when even though in deep learning we use um, gradient descent concept, but I have to you know, remind you that gradient descent is a you know, very traditional optimization technique. We know about long time ago. Okay, it's just now we use it for deep learning. Okay, but the same concept have, has been used I mean, in mathematics to find the optimal uh, uh, solution. Okay, long time ago. Okay, so you see this great this momentum optimization was actually proposed in 1964 okay so so what's the difference between this momentum optimization and uh, the regular gradient descent basically the regular gradient descent you say wait a moment in a regular gradient descent i mean when the slope or the the the, the gradient is larger we also move faster, right? Because the gradient is the, the, the next location. Remember, the P equal to P0 minus eta. You know, and the gradient, right? Okay, uh, of the current P0, actually. Okay, so, um, let, let me... Let's say this is cost function, P0. Okay, so this is the gradient of the cost function. So when the gradient is bigger, it's larger. Of course, I mean, you are, you are going to move faster too, okay, in the regular gradient descent concept. So what's the difference? The difference is that in this approach, there's no acceleration, okay? The previous gradient Okay, the, the gradient you have from the previous step does not have any impact to the gradient to the next, I mean, it does not have the impact to like uh, the movement, speed of movement to the next step. Okay? Pretty much this, uh, the amount of move, movement is determined independently at each location. And uh, of course also by the learning rate, right? So that's the, 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 the primary dis, uh, difference. Okay, here, 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 here. Okay, this is like uh, the, the formula I just wrote. Okay, this one does not care about what the earlier gradient were. Okay, if the local gradient is tiny, it goes very slowly. If the local gradient is large, it goes faster. But uh, no matter it goes slower or it goes faster, it is determined by the local gradient. It is not determined by the gradient of the previous location, right? Okay, so that's the, the difference, okay? So momentum optimization cares a great deal about the previous gradient, okay? At each iteration, it adds the local gradient to the momentum vector. You can sort of treat this momentum act vector as like a, you know, kind of accumulated speed, accumulated speed. Of course, we need to multiply this by a learning rate, eta, okay? Otherwise, it's going to go fa too fast, okay? And it updates the weight by subtracting this momentum vector, okay? So, um, of course, we also incorporate the, the friction, okay? We also need to incorporate the friction, okay? We call that friction, um, we give like a hyperparameter, beta for that friction. We call that uh, hyperparameter as momentum hyperparameter, okay? So, which uh, normally is set between zero and one. When this friction hyperparameter or momentum hyperparameter is said to be zero, it means the friction is very large, okay? If this friction hyperparameter is said to be one, 
it means we have no friction. We have no friction. So the default value for this momentum or friction hyperparameter is 0.9. Okay, 0.9. And uh, the formula for the momentum uh, optimizer goes like this. So see, m, okay, is a sign. This m is what we call momentum vector. Remember, I told you that we are going to, you know, uh, accumulate the, 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 the speed, okay, by this m, the mo momentum vector. So it's going to be a sign, okay, to be beta m. Okay, you are going to, you know, discount, discount the previous momentum vector by the friction, okay, by the friction uh, hyperparameter, okay, plus eta, okay, uh, uh, the, the, the gradient times the gradient, okay. So basically this is a local, uh, uh, mom, local um, gradient, okay, and then, okay, you, you add this thing to, you add this thing to the, the previous uh, 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 momentum vector, okay, pretty much. And this is the resulting momentum vector. And the current location will be the previous location minus this M. Okay? So this is like uh, the momentum optimizer algorithm. Okay? So you can, you can do a, e a very easy calculation okay, to see that, okay, um, you know, uh, um, what is the term, uh, the, 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 the highest possible, you know, uh, learning rate, uh, I mean, or, or like, a, like a, you know, or not, not learning rate, I mean, the highest possible moving speed, okay, if you use like, a, if you compare the momentum optimizer with the, the gradient descent, the regular gradient descent optimizer, you will find that, okay, if beta is 0 0.9, okay, the terminal velocity, one minus beta is uh, equal to 10 times the gradient times the learning rate. So in other words, okay, uh, it is going to move 10 times faster than the, the regular gradient descent, okay? which is obviously a good thing, right? I mean, uh, when it comes to training the model, okay, because it's going to, you know, the model convergence is going to be much faster, okay? So this allows the momentum optimization to escape from per two much faster than gradient descent, okay? And also, um, we see that when the input have very different scales of the, uh, the cost function will look like an elongated ball. Remember, I mean, we, we draw that, uh, you know. Mm. So I, I, I think I draw something like this, right? Okay, so it's like an elongated ball, or I told you, like, it's kind of like, a, you know, the, the football, okay, the rugby, the ball used in the rugby, you know, which is like, a, you know, cut like a, by half, okay, from, you know, the long axis. And uh, that mean, if you, you are here, then it's going to move something to, he, to uh, my drawing is terrible. It's going to move something like a, like here, okay? Because it's this direction. I mean, it's go. I mean, the the height go down faster. This direction, the height go down slower. So as a result, you will see the ball actually move uh, in a curve, okay? And uh, but um, you know. In contrast, momentum optimization will roll down the button to the very faster and the faster until it reaches the button, okay? So it's going to be something like a, 
you know, it's not going to change this curve, but it's going to move much, much faster. But uh, um, so if we don't use special normalization, the upper layers will often end up having input with very different scales. So using momentum optimization help a lot. So it can also help roll past local optimal, okay? Because if you roll faster, it it's, uh, slightly help you to escape from local optimal as well, okay? So this is uh, some benefit that we can have if you use the momentum algorithm, okay, optimization. But uh, of course, like, uh, you know, uh, there are also uh, some uh, disadvantage, okay? Uh, just like if you use a larger learning rate, okay, what happens is that, okay, uh, you know, uh, the optimizer, optimizer may overshoot a bit. I mean, when, what I mean is like, uh, okay, when you reach this uh, local minimum, it may, it may go too fast and uh, go and, 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 and to here, and then you come back. So it's going to be, you know, it's going to escalate, okay? Just like if you have a bigger learning rate, it's going to escalate near the optimal location. However, okay, remember in the momentum uh, optimization, we have the friction, right? Having that friction help us eventually stabilize uh, to the optimal location because learning rate is fixed. So it's going to, you know, fluctuate all the time. But the uh, momentum optimization, because we have the friction, so it helps us to stabilize. Okay, it's just like it will take a, a, a while I mean, for this uh, friction to you know, take a, into effect and uh, help you to converge, okay? So in order to implement momentum in Keras, it's very, very easy, okay? Um, you still call it SGD, but uh, in here, okay, not only you provide the learning rate, but also you provide the momentum equal to 0 0.9, which indicate the value of that momentum or friction hyperparameter, okay? So then uh, the Keras will know that, oh, the, you, are, you are talking about momentum uh, optimizer, okay? So the, the problem with the momentum optimizer, optimization is that you have one more hyperparameter to tune, right? But uh, Keep in mind that you, you, most of the time you do not need to, you know, change this value, okay? It is, in practice, it almost always, you know, goes faster than the regular gradient descent, okay? You just use 0 0.9 for this momentum hyperparameter and you are good, okay? You should be good to go, okay? Well... Uh, well, it's about time. So let's take 10 minutes break, okay? Uh, when we come back, we will talk m about some more uh, optimize optimizers, okay?
is uh, called natural uh, accelerated gradient. Okay, it's a uh, uh, you know um, proposed by a guy called Yuri Nesterov. Uh, just by his this name, you know he's uh, from Russia. Or, like, uh, I mean, Yugoslavian. Okay, so in 1983, again, this this one was much earlier than than um, the deep learning. Okay, um, so. It almost always uh, uh, faster. Okay, it's faster than the momentum optimization. Optimization. Okay, the idea is actually very very simple. Okay, think about this. Okay, um, because we want to move toward the lowest location, right? Lowest place on the irregular surface, and uh, uh, usually, okay. The direction you obtain from the next step is more accurate than the direction you obtain from the current step. Okay. Um, again, let me use the elongated ball as an example. When you are here, what is the momentum you, you, you obtain? Remember the, 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 the movement is direction is somewhere like this, right? So the moving direction is here, right? It's it's going this way, right? Going downward, right? Okay. But think about this. What is the what is the direction? Where, where is the lowest location? It's here, right? So the direction should be here, right? Should the, the correct direction is here, right? But the initial direction 